CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening. It is now 6.31. We're a minute late. Welcome to the October 24th, 2024 meeting of the Arlington School Committee. We are conducting this meeting remotely um, so that all votes will be a roll call vote. Uh, warning to anybody who is coming in uh, online that uh, watch your mute button because anything you say when your mute button is off can be heard in this room and broadcast to the real world. Uh, we have a public, we will begin with a public comment session. Let me remind folks that the public comment session is for three minutes and three minutes only. It will be strictly timed. We do cut public comment for 20 minutes. And as we've got six or seven speakers, it will be very strictly enforced. As soon as you hear the sound of the Shinkansen train coming through, that indicates that your time has expired. And please finish your sentence so we can go on to the next person. Um, we do not comment back because that would violate the open meeting law uh, because uh, we can only comment and discuss on items that are clearly on the agenda. We will begin with Dennis Grudkowski and Dimitri. Patricia will be next, so be ready. Hi. Want to sit here? Can you sit, we can sit together? Yes. Great. Hello? Hey, thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, so my name is Dennis, and I'm the father of Andre, Dimitri, and Victor. And if you'll uh, identify your full name and address, street address. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Dennis Grudkowski, 57 Wollaston Avenue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dennis, and I'm the father of Andre, Dimitri, and Victor, who are 10th, 6th, and 2nd graders. Um, I'm here to discuss their math experience. Uh, Dimitri scored well in the 6th grade bypass math exam. Um, he got 14 out of the 16 correct answers, um, but he didn't pass. Um, my other son, Andre, um, we're not sure how well he did because the school refuses to share the results with us since 2020. Um, their MCAS scores are very good. Um, Dimitri's MCAS score at fifth, fourth grade was 535. Andre's at third grade was 548. Uh, current IXL scores for sixth grade Dimitri is 770. Tenth grade Andre is 1290. These scores show they're well ahead of their current grade level and they're bored and unchallenged in their current math classes. Um, we engage them in extracurricular math activities to keep them from stagnating and to keep their, uh, them enthusiastic about learning about math. Um, it's clear their understanding exceeds the material being taught. Andre is almost at a college freshman math level, uh, but he and Dimitri are placed in classes that are too easy uh, and for them. Tests uh, which are described as challenging are not, and uh, why can't they just be placed in classes that are at their ability? Um, Arlington's heterogeneous learning model seems to cater to the lowest common denominator learner maybe, and the students like ours uh, uh, might be suffering because of that. My kids can assist other students in their learning very well since they know the material, but uh, what about their progress? Uh, it's frustrating that advanced math classes are limited to only 15 students when previous years had more. It's surely not more expensive to have additional classes sit in a classroom to be taught by the same teacher. It might be inconvenient for the school, but it would be a way of offering students math education suited to their level. Another issue is not bypassing sixth grade math might lock students out of AP Physics C in senior year. Um, the, there are alternate paths, I guess. I don't really understand all the complexity of it, but it seems like um, guidance counselors should make that very clear for the students who are really interested in that. Um, we shouldn't be creating barriers to education, we should be removing them. Um, I think this bypass approach seems dumb. I think we should just create um, classes that are appropriate for the students and their skill levels. Um, there's inconsistency in the bypass math test. Dimitri lost points for not explaining answers in the sixth grade way, even though he got the correct answers. And apparently, Andre's test can't, allegedly can't even be found. So we're not sure how he did. Um, I understand the rubric that is now used to evaluate the exam was only recently created because students, parents like us were asking for it. Um, that seems crazy. And these students have surpassed pandemic learning gaps, yet the system is acknowledging that with appropriate classes. Uh, please meet these talented students at their level and provide the classes they deserve. If that means learning with older students, so be it. The pandemic created challenges in learning, but these kids overcame those challenges. Please do not create more challenges for these kids. Uh, whose educational experience has been significantly impacted. Please let the classes challenge them, not the school system. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Masiro. 
Oh, is that three minutes? For That's three minutes. Yes. Oh, for Dima too. I thought we. I, I, we'll, we'll bring him back at the end. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm going to rotate this. That's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Patricia Mazzura, I'm mom of Jacob Mazzura, 18 Cleveland Street in Arlington. I was here last week. Thank, Thank you, you for having a chance to speak again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also regarding the bypass test um, and the admission criteria. Uh, we would like to request to reevaluate the student, including my son, as well as the other students, for entrance into the seventh grade math in, at Gibbs. Um, and again, just like uh, the other parents will be talking, my son also scored really highly in, uh, in IXL 780, which indicates end of seventh grade math. Uh, he also scored really high in MCAS. Uh, again, top score, top score in MCAS. Um, uh, I will not talk about the bypass test and the subjective aspects of it, but I understand this was the only thing being evaluated, considered for evaluation. It's a, it's, it is a very important test, given that this, it's a yes-no answer into the seventh grade math, which closes door for any type of math acceleration. I also want to mention that long-term in Arlington, uh, that Arlington is very, very rigid in terms of admitting students or letting them test out of math. It's, it doesn't even allow doubling up, so even if my son studies outside or other students do, they still can't take a test and just get into the class that fits their, their learning profile in math. Instead, they're in these heterogeneous classes, and for some reason, they are being punished for working hard or really being passionate about a particular subject, in this case, math. Um, there are, just like before mentioned, there are certain courses which are effectively out of reach, such as AP Physics C or just really difficult. There is also just in general at this point, they are being really slowed down just to be accelerated in high school. Or it's, There's so many opportunities in Arlington High School. It has an incredible program, and I'm really like excited for my children to go there, but they probably won't be able to to use most of these classes. Um, and as you've seen, you've seen my son, he can speak for himself. He's very bored, unmotivated uh, in being in class. I mean, this isn't just me being a tiger mom. This is my son asking me to please help. Um, so again, the class only has 15 students today. Before previous years had 27 to 30 students. There is space for these children. We would, we would like to ask to please reevaluate, consider the other criteria for some reason. It was a singular test as opposed to a broad picture of, of, the, of the child. And it does says that the, the process was supposed to consider other things, not just this test. We don't understand why the process wasn't followed as it's advertised. Um, again, this isn't more expensive. I know it's inconvenient, but I, I mean, it's not about convenience. These children are asking to be challenged, so please consider putting them in the class. And please, in the long term, look at the math program. Be a lot more flexible. Other school districts allow testing out of things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mikhail is next, followed by Gaitari, so I'm going to do, do it in that order. Mikhail? Start with your name and street address, please. My name is Mikhail Afanasyev. I live at 50 Trowbridge Street. And uh, my child, Ilana Afanasyev, she is very good at math. So she was really hoping when she was getting to Gibbs at, about for the interesting math. And um, so she, of course, took the math bypass, te my bypass test. And she solved most of the problems corrected, correctly, but she was graded down because a lot of her explanations were above the sixth grade. And I mean, that makes sense, right? Because your Excel score was 860, so halfway through the eighth grade. And last MCAS that we know results of is 560, the best you can get. And she is ready for the seventh grade mass. Your mass teacher at Hardy thinks that she is ready for the seventh grade mass, maybe even eighth. But she is now being forced to take the sixth grade mass that she is already knows. And that's, of course, a big letdown for her, right? Because she's doubting her abilities, like, why isn't school believing in me? <laughs> I, I did solve everything, why not, All right? And she comes home every day and she says, Mass was born in Kadei, don't they want to teach us? Isn't the school supposed to teach? And is it like the message that you want to get out of the school? All right, and like the thing is, Arlington seems pretty special, right? Because I have some friends in Belmont and in, in there, like if you're in the high school, for example, you can skip the mass classes if the counselor agrees, but Arlington, we talked to the mass director, and she says that Arlington has no flexibility in that. 
there is no more options to bypass any mass test. You have to take all of them in sequence. So she told me that the teacher's recommendations would be ignored, student wishes would be ignored, mm -hmm. test results would be ignored, Ilana would be forced to take all the classes one after another, and every single class in her middle school career and the high school time is going to be boring for her because it's just so much below her level. All right, and even the one class that we have is 15 students, right? She's looking at this class and says, how come, right? I did not get to the class. There's plenty of students in this class. The other classes are 30 students. There's already teachers. There's already time slot. I could be there, but why? Are they not letting me in? It's just that I, we have no explanations. I cannot explain to her why she is not saying, other than to say that mm -hmm. someone at Arlington High School, they don't want to have advanced math classes. So I'm asking the school committee to please reconsider this policy, right? Let students choose which classes they can take. Let them skip the classes if they want to. If someone is good with math, and of course, if the teacher agrees, if they pass the test, whatever, then they should be able to take the more advanced class series. There is Please, like, schools should let students enjoy learning. It should not hold them back, those who are good at the learning. That's it. Thank you. Next will be Gaitari Perlin. Hi, my name is Gaitari Perlin. Um, right. And street address, please. 88 Paul Revere Road. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to hear us out. I'm part of the math group that you've been hearing from, uh, one of the, the families that has been affected by a very uh, poor decision um, we consider that has been made that really uh, sets up, um, uh, disadvantages our kids and discourages them from pursuing STEM curriculum which actually starts in the elementary school. Uh, that interest starts in the elementary school. I can tell you that um, I work in, uh, not in the defense sector as a, a researcher uh, in advanced technologies, and, and the number of times that I hear on a, on a daily, monthly basis uh, regarding workforce development in the STEM field, you, you won't believe it. We have a dearth of uh, uh, skill set in, in the STEM field, and I can't emphasize enough how critical it is, not just to our uh, town's district's, uh, district's uh, well-being, but also at the national level. Um, I'm just really passionate about STEM. Uh, I had the opportunity 30 years ago to skip a grade in math. That allowed me to take advanced physics uh, in high school. That set up my career as an engineer, uh, going on to pursue a PhD. Um, back when women were, it wasn't that common to, to, to pursue PhDs. Um, it is of the utmost importance at the national level. I can't tell you how important working in defense has opened my eyes to the criticality of STEM skills development. That being said, I have distributed uh, the data on, on the, the students for this group of parents whose um, uh, in objective test scores do not match the subjective criteria that has been used, um, at, at least in this year's, I can speak for this year's results. Um, the explanations that we've been given by the administrative leadership team uh, are not acceptable. Um, we're looking for the board's help to hel uh, help us solve this critical problem for our students today um, because they are definitely affected. Um, we understand that there are long-term issues that need to be considered, but as you heard from a number of parents, there are only 15 students in the class right now. There is capacity to um, handle an additional 10 that clearly are qualified by objective measures. Why, what the subjective criteria is being driven by, we don't understand. It's illogical, um, it's ineffective, it doesn't uh, benefit anybody. This is a lose-lose situation. If it's d driven by equity reasons, then we should, this is not how we should approach equity. We should open up more opportunities, not take away opportunities from some people and give it to other people. Equity is about opening up more opportunities. We, as a parent group, group are all in support of uh, being inclusive and bringing everybody up, but don't hold anyone back. Thank you. Uh, Dmitry Vasilev. Name and street address, please. Um, my name is Dmitry Vasilyev, 18 Cleveland Street. Uh, thank you, committee, for hearing me out. Uh, two weeks ago, you heard from my child, Jacob, about his experience. And 
uh, I hope you understand the degree of upset and he has about uh, about the results of his math bypass test and I share his uh, share with him that he is absolutely can uh, can uh, do seventh grade math or even higher so how about we make schools about kids and not about grown-ups it's important for us to hear the kids and hear what they need and they have a lot of similar kids on the same boat we need to hear them out we need to hear when they ask for challenge and it's also important to for them to have an opportunity to fail safely they will fail later in life, but this failure will be easily corrected, and the stakes are low. And if they think that they, 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 they can handle the course, why not? Why not listen to them and not grown up say you cannot and put such a rigid walls? And this way we're sandbagging them. I hope you know the term. Mm -hmm. Basically, for, for them not to fail and later in life they will be just scared to take any risks that's that's a good learning experience for them and it's part of a natural learning experience to take risks and sometimes fail but i i'm i'm pretty sure i know my child and he will not fail he will ask even for more challenge so this is one aspect of this and like in a in the movie frozen there was this song my life is a sequence of doors in my face and the first closed door in the face of two of my child was coming from math department of Arlington Public Schools. And it's sad because like normally I thought that math department should be not like not preventing children from learning math. That's the way how I see it, but shouldn't be otherwise. And to facilitate learning, that's that's not pushing not pushing them down. So I would like very particular things. I would like to expand the, you to consider expanding seventh bypass math uh, program. You can eliminate this test. So make the children just say, I would like to try seventh grade and expand it because most likely there will be more, 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 more kids. And right now, right now, seven, 17, uh, 15 children, Right? Why? Why? What? What would you make to say no to these children who want to participate in this class? And also, it's it's also this this uh, requirements of the prerequisites are really rigid. Make it optional. Thank you. Thank you, um, Victor Perlin, and then we'll bring back Dimitri. Uh, my name is uh, Victor Perlin, 88 Paul Revere Road. Mm -hmm. uh, my son Benji is in sixth grade in Gibbs. Mm -hmm. And um, you're hearing from us already quite a bit. Not the first meeting, we've met with Dr. Homan, other leadership here in math department. We met with you guys and we keep coming and we keep reiterating. And it's not because we just, you know, have nothing else to do. It's because it's very important. Mm -hmm. And what we're observing right now it's already seven weeks into the year, school year. What we're observing, our kids are not getting math education. Basically, they come to math class, they don't learn anything, and we know what's in the curriculum for sixth grade. They will not learn anything for the whole sixth grade. So we are trying to change that. Now, we, Dr. Holman listened to us and uh, understands us, and we appreciate that she provides feedback and started, I understand you started some kind of investigation how to improve the system. The system that you have now for math bypass for advanced kids is clearly broken. It maybe has been broken for years. Now we run into it, so now we are speaking up. Um, what we want is that our kids get that education. Now, what's particularly frustrating that that system is not a rocket science. It's pretty easy to identify which kids in math are able to do certain grade level. You have a standard test at Excel. All the kids in this group of kids that we're talking about, they are at upper seventh or eighth grade level, and one kid is even ninth grade level tested, but they're all sitting at sixth grade math doing nothing there. And um, what you're suggesting, you're gonna do certain actions to uh, identify in the future, but for now, one year into the school, 
kids will do nothing, and in fact, they probably will regress by doing stuff that's really, really slowing them down. Doing like multiplication arithmetic stuff, like they should be doing al advanced algebra, they should be doing quadratic equations, they're sitting there doing, you know, 7.5 times, times 3, something like that, which is their homework in October of sixth grade. So it's frustrating. We can do better. Uh, you you probably familiar, many of you, with Arlington Soccer Club. We have it here. A lot of kids participate. It has similar issue that advanced kids don't, if you have kids at much higher level than other kids, than average, you probably better select them and they go and study, study or play in the same team together. It's very bad for kids to be mixed very different levels, uh, skill levels in soccer equally. It's very bad to do dif mixing different skill levels in math. So in Arlington Soccer Club, we have a system. It's been, it also had its problems historically, but it's been polished and developed, in which, frankly, much more effort goes into placements than in math. If we can do it in soccer, much more effort, much better results. Thank you. Could we in soccer? Please, let's do it in math also. And Dmitry Grudowski. Grudkowski. That's correct. Yeah. Hello. Seven okay. Hi. Uh, do I have to say my name? Yeah, say your name. Hello, my name is Dimitri Gurkowski, and I would also like to talk about how most other kids should be placed into the next seventh grade level, and how in the uh, level I am in now, the mixing of students' levels doesn't mix well, so there's people on really high levels that don't reach their potential because they get held back in like these opportunities. And our teacher always has to like come back and we spend so much time on like one simple thing because the levels are so different and the higher level kids don't get to do what they think they should be doing. And as others have said, there are so many more spots for the next class. So I think there's well enough space and there should just be another option to try it out at least. And it's almost November, and we're still reviewing volume, and like, the, the quizzes are so easy, and we're just reviewing stuff. And it's just so easy in general. It, I'm so bored. I don't get to do anything. Yeah. Our teacher, even like, she doesn't even tell us what to really do. She just gives us instructions on what to do and then she just sits at her desk for the whole class. But if I, I think if I went to the next level, our teacher would actually be interested in teaching math. But now I'm just held back and I am bored and I don't get to do anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, thanks for talking to us. That concludes public comment. Let me make notice that tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI because all members are not present and we have one member participating remotely. All votes will be required to be taken by roll call. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded they may be visible to others. All participants are asked to activate your camera and provide your full name in the interest of developing a rec record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Finally, both Zoom participants and people watching on ACMI 
can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda program. We now can, uh, I also want to welcome Julie Keyes, who's our AEA representative, and Leo Fritsch and Zach Fan, who are our new AHS student representatives. So, Leo or Zach, would you like to say something? It's a welcome. Thanks for having us. <laughs> we are required by law to have a student representative on the committee, so you're, you're very important. Uh, what's happening at the high school? Uh, I have like a little. List. We had a list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, upcoming on Saturday, we have homecoming, um, which the student council is running. We're really excited about that. Um, we have, we just finished. Oh, can you talk oh, yeah. into the mic? Sorry. Uh, as long as it's pointed to you, you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, upcoming on Saturday, we have. Homecoming, which the student council is running. Um, we're going to host that at the, at the high school, and we're really excited for that. Um, we just finished Club Day, mm -hmm. which is like an event, um, I don't know, for clubs to get more uh, uh, yeah, attendance, just to, like advertise their own club. <coughs> um, we're ending the sports season soon, so we're getting into like playoffs, and senior nights are happening. And then finally, we have wellness workshops coming up, which is like, I don't know if you guys know what those are, but it's just like. No, I don't, so tell us what it is. Okay, so basically, we've had these, I don't know, for as long as I've been in high school at least, which is, it's just like workshops that you go to during mm -hmm. school that promote wellness among AHS. Okay. So it's things mm -hmm. like, um, sometimes there's like mental health presentations, sometimes it's just like, Yoga. Sometimes it's just like, uh, like having conversations with each other. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. And hello, Leo. What's up? A anything you'd like to say? Uh, uh, microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think he covered all of our bases. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, let me also just make sure that our remote participants can hear us and we can hear them. Uh, Ms. Exton, hello. Hi, good evening. And uh, uh, Allison Elmer, Ms. Elmer. Can I hear you? Say something. Yes, I am here present. Okay, good. Thank you very much. We now continue on the agenda. The next item is the, um, we begin with the Pierce, uh, Pierce School, uh, School Improvement Plan. Welcome, Superintendent. <clears throat> All right. As we welcome uh, Mr. Armadi, and I'll let you introduce uh, the new assistant principal at Pierce as well, um, I just want to say thank you for being the first presentation. I'll be driving, so let me know when you want me to advance the slide, and we look forward to hearing what's going on uh, with Pierce. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you. I am battling a, battling a bit of a cold, so I'm going to do my very best this evening. <clears throat> thank you uh, to the school committee and Dr. Homan for giving us the opportunity to share our plan with you. My name is Andrew Amati, and I'm the proud principal of Pierce Elementary, and this is Heidi Clement, our wonderful and new assistant principal. <clears throat> we are so proud of the work that our students and staff are doing, and we look forward to sharing this presentation with you this evening and taking any questions you may have. This is mostly a data-driven um, presentation, so just keep in mind that while we're excited to share our data, it doesn't do full justice to the work that's being done uh, for our students by our staff. Good evening, my name is Heidi Clement. I'm the new assistant principal up here, so I'm happy to be here. Um, this evening we are gonna share some multiple pieces of data with you. Uh, we will highlight some of the successes we had over the past year, as well as some challenges we are still facing. Um, we are going to discuss some changes we've made in our school goals um, that are driven by data from students, um, academic and non-academic. But overall, we are very pleased with the direction we are heading towards our long-term goals. Um, the Pierce is a K-5 to school um, with 16 sections of students. We have two kindergarten and first grade classrooms and then three second through fifth grade classrooms. We are also a METCO uh, school housing 13 METCO students, which is um, the largest recipient of students at the elementary level. Um, we are also home to a supported learning community for third and fourth grade students with dyslexia and dysgraphia. 
Um, and we are fortunate to have two new playgrounds at the front and the back of the community, um, which our students and um, community use all the time. We thank you for your support of those projects over the last four years. Um, the specific areas we plan to cover in this pre presentation are around chronic abs absenteeism, achievement and growth um, you, according to the MCAS and ELA math and science, our DIVLS data, and the climate and culture survey the, um, given to the students. Um, I'll pass it over to Andrew, who will introduce you to the data. All right. So. <clears throat> Perhaps my biggest goal as principal over the last four and a half years has been reducing um, the percentage of students that are chronically absent and increasing uh, students to come whenever they are um, healthy enough to do so. <clears throat> Last year, I was asked by the committee how low we thought we could get chronic absenteeism, and I replied that I thought we could half it from 10.7 to 5.7, and we've nearly achieved that. Um, the students that were chronically absent, excuse me, absent last year were mostly due to prolonged sicknesses and travel abroad. Our staff, um, administrators, were really um, organized last year about sending letters, making calls, making home visits, and being out in the community to try to have a positive impact. <clears throat> and I'm most proud of our families that are experiencing low income, um, that we have got them into school more frequently. And that is um, a goal that we will hang on to uh, moving forward. Kind of a hard pivot to uh, language arts, but um, this is our, uh, our language arts um, data from last year. Um, overall, our achievement was relatively flat, uh, with 66% of students um, meeting or exceeding the grade level standard. Um, we had growth of 55, um, which is relatively consistent uh, to years past. One highlight you can't see in here, though, is that 72% um, of our third graders met or exceeded uh, the grade level standards, which is higher um, than has been in the past. And I also um, want to briefly just talk um, about our EL curriculum, which has moved from a K-4 to uh, pilot in, into our whole school, K-5. to we are seeing a lot of early promise in this curriculum. Um, our teachers are working very hard um, to learn the, excuse me, learn the curriculum, to plan professionally, um, to, to make assignments and units fun, and our students are really excited about it. Um, we've had students very excited in our fourth and fifth grade, um, thinking about democracy and thinking about human rights, and they're so excited they've come down and, and shared their work with me, um, and it's only October. So that's good news. Um, our biggest gains um, uh, in terms of um, growth last year, let me make sure I'm on the right slide, yeah, um, are for our students um, in the lowest performing uh, subcategory of students, um, as well as our students that are labeled low income. Um, this is good news in a sense that we are making growth in areas that are students that are in these categories because we know that these students and families oftentimes have less, ac or less access to resources um, than other students. And we are proud that at least in these measures, we feel like we're turning um, the tide in terms of language arts. There's a long ways to go, um, as you saw with only 66% of our students. Uh, meeting or exceeding, um, but we feel that we're on the right track and we're excited to have this new curriculum. I wanted to show uh, the committee this evening what were um, some of the areas we're having uh, a challenging time with respect to our achievement and growth, um, most notably uh, with black students. And as you can see, there's concerning um, data in here in that two, only two of 12 black students met or exceeded grade level standards in language arts um, as compared to students in other categories. This is coupled with um, a low average SGP. And while, <clears throat> excuse me, the N, um, the, the number of students um, is relatively low. I think it's ex um, I think it's especially important to highlight this for the committee this evening, uh, that this is an area of concern. Um, and one that has been a concern um, over the course of the last few years. Uh, 
okay, we're seeing some strong, um, this is math achievement and growth. We're seeing some strong upticks in achievement and growth, which we're very proud of. Um, we have um, increased our overall students that are meeting or exceeding the standard um, up from 64% last year to 73% this year. We have overall school growth of 62.4. And our fifth grade team uh, achieved an SGP of 77 last year, which was a number that I've never seen. And in fact, when I first saw it, I didn't um, believe it. I thought it was a mistake. Um, and that is a, a, a huge nod um, to our staff, our, our fifth grade teachers, and all of the teachers um, in grades K through four um, that gave them the prerequisite skills to be able to have such amazing growth. We're seeing a larger number of students moving from the, um, I'm sorry, from the into the exceeding category, and that's been two years uh, in a row that we've seen, uh, and I can't read it from here, but it looks like over 20% of our students are now in the exceeding category, which is an area that we're particularly proud of, um, as well as more students moving out of the um, not meeting and into the partially meeting, which correlates to our, our high SGP. I've never had this much water in a day, so I apologize for all the, all the breaks. I'm mostly a coffee drinker. Um, okay, we're seeing some high growth um, in multiple focal groups here. Uh, most notably, our students in the low income and high needs um, categories. I shall also just say I hate using those labels, and, and I don't like that they're on here, but I'm using them because I think it's particularly uh, important that we stick to the labels that are, uh, that are assigned to us. But... Um, to see um, an SGP of 65, almost 66, for our families in the, in the low income, our students in a low income category, um, is something I'm particularly proud of. It's something we need to continue to focus on, but it um, is something that our um, that over the course of the next couple years may allow us, if we can stay on this trend, to close the achievement gap. And that is something that um, is exciting to me. It's exciting to our staff, and something we work very hard on. Um, yeah. And yet when we look um, at race, um, similar uh, to what we see in language arts, um, our black students are um, not having the same experience uh, with respect to academic achievement and growth. Um, every other category of, of uh, students um, is having S or has SGP of 50, um, nine or higher with multiple groups um, over 70. This is an area for us to continue to investigate, and um, this is something that we, we um, are committed to improving in the future years. Science remains an area of relative um, um, high achievement um, at Pierce. Um, it has been for, for several years, and it continues to get stronger. Um, students report this often as being their favorite uh, core subject. They rave about um, science in the upper grades. Uh, the curriculum is interesting. It's lab-focused, lab-based, hands-on, and I give credit to all of our um, upper grade level teachers, as well as science coach Sarah Huber for being instrumental um, in making this um, curriculum both exciting and rigorous, and um, this is just one example uh, or one data point that suggests that um, we're doing well in science. Okay, here are, is our DIPLS data. Um, as you can see, the percentage of students in meeting and exceeding surpasses the number of students um, in below or well below grade level. Our third grade class is outperforming the district. However, the other grade levels are performing slightly below the district level. Um, two years ago, all, grade, all grades were using Lucy Calkins' curriculum. Last year, kindergarten and fourth grade piloted the EL curriculum, and this year, all K through uh, five classes are using EL. We are hoping the change in curriculum will be seen over the next few years and a change in the improvement in the DIPL scores. Um, also, we just recently hired a point .4 um, literacy tutor, which we are hoping will support the needs of the students that are below and in the yellow. Um, range of performing on the DIPL scores. And in addition to our general education teachers, our literacy specialists, our special education teachers and multilingual teachers, um, we are all working together to support the needs of our students well below benchmark. 
with this level of support in place, we intend to decrease the numbers of students performing below and well below benchmark. Um, when looking at climate and culture data, this is a huge win for us. Um, we can see our school increased in three areas, school safety, teacher-student relationships, and sense of belonging. Um, we maintained our progress in all the other areas, and we outperformed the district in all indicators. We are very proud of this data, especially in the area of sense of belonging, because that was a priority area on our student improvement plan last year, and we wanted to improve it, and we did. There's a lot of text on this slide, so I'm not going to read it. Um, these are similar goals to what we've had in the past. Um, but these are streamlined and modified uh, to center our student experience around high levels of engagement, to focus on academic discourse, and to make a more intentional focus on improving students' writing, um, and continuing to make sure Pierce is a place where all students feel um, that they belong within our school. Before I go on um, to the last slide, I also want to um, acknowledge that, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say it. Um, so, DESI sets out nine um, subcategories of academic and non-academic uh, areas for schools um, to meet to become a school of achievement. And this year, Pierce met all nine criteria areas, but we were not awarded that school of recognition because only 94% of our students with disabilities took the MCAS. And I'm sharing that this evening because, well, <clears throat> that doesn't mean everything to a school to get recognized. Our staff and our teachers and our support staff and our students deserve to be recognized uh, for meeting all of the objective measures um, that are required to be a school of recognition. Um, we are instead labeled um, a school needing, um, requiring or needing intervention, uh, which I refute. Okay. Wait, yeah, okay, I, I'm fine. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was a pause, I just misinterpreted. Is it okay? Going. Sorry, I'm trying to save my, my uh, voice here. Um, trying to achieve our goals, okay. Um, things we're working on. We're working on expanding peer observations. We've been doing this for a couple years. Our staff is pretty excited about it. Um, what this means in practice is that often staff go see somebody in another department in another grade level. <clears throat> excuse me, um, and share observations in a, in a colleague to colleague, um, not with me there or, or anybody else, and it's, it's taken root in an organic way, and we're considering or hoping to expand this um, into other Arlington public schools. Um, I know the Dowin is working on similar goals, and this is something uh, we may be trying to do across schools. Continuing to focus on making sure that our, our um, Students come to school, notably in some of those so, subgroups I, descri I described earlier. Uh, we hope to continue to um, expand uh, before school, um, after school care, and um, promoting a strong uh, tutoring program, which is something we had in place last year, and that we're trying to get off the ground again this year. Um, we're working hard on, on professional development around uh, EL. It's the majority of our grade level meetings, the majority of our after school meetings are centered around um, making sure our teachers understand and learn uh, what this curriculum is and how to make it exciting for our students. We hope to, <clears throat> we hope to conduct empathy interviews. We, we, um, we're just learning about this uh, uh, in terms of how, how to conduct these, and, um, but this is something that we're interested in as an ILT. Uh, and perhaps expanding this through grades uh, two through five over the course of the year. And a, a, a personal goal is to con continue to distribute leadership throughout our ILT and through the um, pilot subcommittees, uh, which we're, ho we're hoping to begin in January of the new year. The resources um, that would be helpful to us um, are increased uh, reading specialists. Right now, um, we have one reading specialist, um, so we are using, uh, we're fortunate enough to get some dollars to hire tutors, um, but the reality is, I think if we are going to meet the needs of all students in reading, um, we need additional personnel. Um, I believe we also need to consider expanding um, either our social work and or counseling services, and I wanna give a nod to AYCC. Um, they have provided tremendous support at the Pierce School for students and families. 
um, and we appreciate all of their support. Um, and I would advocate in any way I could to uh, expand programming through them. They're, they're outstanding. And then um, just for future years, just making sure we have access to dollars for tutoring uh, for our students that requ would require it or can require it, um, it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Superintendent, any comments before we move it to the committee for questions? Um, I only want to say that I think it's important to recognize that one of the things Mr. Amati pointed out is that we're actually seeing in some of Pierce's results the opportunity to close an achievement gap. We talk a lot about what does it actually mean to close an achievement gap. It means that you have strong growth for all students and stronger growth for students in focal groups because that's what it looks like to accelerate learning. And we see that in these results. And so I would join Mr. Amati in refuting the idea that they may require assistance because I think what they're actually demonstrating is that they're doing an incredible job supporting students and families, particularly students in our focal groups, but really all students all the time. Um, and I would also point out that Mr. Amati probably wouldn't mention this, um, but has had uh, a number of assistant principals who have been exceptionally successful in supporting the school. Um, we're very excited that Ms. Clement has joined the Arlington Public Schools and we've had assistant principals move on. And so, and Mr. Amati also frequently has um, interns who are there helping the leadership team expand the work that they are doing with staff uh, and students in the school. And that's a testament to our work to inspire new leaders to join education, which we desperately need. So thank you for that work and for everything that you've done for Pierce's students because it shows. Thank you, Dr. Holman. And while I have the opportunity, I'd like to introduce uh, Jorge Mata Otero, who is a Pierce intern uh, this semester. Hi, everybody. Thank you for letting me witness all this. <laughs> it's an open public meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the committee? Dr. Allison Ampey. So you clearly have the secret recipe for the secret sauce for math. <laughs> How can we share it out? Are you asking how we might be able to do this in other places or with respect to other content areas? Um, I was thinking other places, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking mainly other places. I think one of the things that's worked really well is focusing on academic uh, discourse, which I know is like buzzwordy, but the idea that students have frequent opportunities to describe their thinking, to challenge one another's thinking in a peer-to-peer -peer way in a classroom is motivating to students. And when you couple that with grade level tasks that are um, challenging, I think that matters a lot. And of course, there's technical things like making sure that there's an hour a day to do it and making sure that those are uninterrupted, um, which are more logistically oriented. But I, I do think focusing on making sure students are doing the majority of talking, thinking, writing, um, and mathing is probably not um, a word, but that, I think that matters a lot. Okay, I guess my question kind of goes to the superintendent. Sure. How, how are we cross-pollinating good results? Yeah, I think one of the things that has been um, resonatingly clear to myself and Dr. Ford Walker over the last couple of months is that we need to take a deep dive into what it is that we're doing that's meeting grade level standard across the board. And so um, we're, we're uh, happy to share this at the CIAA meeting that's coming up in November and plan to, uh, but there is some targeted work that we're gonna be doing this year. Mr. Mahdi actually started to speak to some of it uh, to be very focused when we're in classrooms on what the grade level standard is, uh, what the tasks are that we're putting in front of students um, and the extent to which vertically we're preparing students for rigorous instruction in all grade levels and all content areas, but in math. Um, and we've, some of this work has already begun. I spent some time in classrooms today and having these conversations with administrators following and then talking about what kind of feedback is generative for ensuring that we're aligning content to grade level standard or higher and being really clear that that's our objective, grade level standard or higher. Um, and then from there, I think obviously we're hearing that we need to take a look at some structures and mechanisms that we have for accelerating when students are prepared for additional challenge. And so we need to look at that in core instruction. Work on academic discourse does that because it requires you to use the language of the content area 
And it requires the educator also to say, what is the language of content area in this grade level? And are students able to use that language to do the tasks that demonstrate mastery at grade level so that we can expand or accelerate if necessary? And so we'll take, we need to take a look at those structures, and we're going to. Um, but I think what Pierce is demonstrating is that that constant talk about math, and I've been in Pierce math classrooms, Pierce fifth grade math classrooms, where they saw that growth of unprecedented seven levels of what, 77? Is that what you said? Yeah. Um, they talk constantly about the concepts that they're learning using the language in math in those classes where that's happening. And that is a difference maker when it comes to their ability to then translate that into a written mm -hmm. exam. Okay, great, thank you. May I, may I add one additional thing to that? I feel like I should have said it mm -hmm. because um, part of this is linked to our wonderful math coach, Steph McKenna, who can't be here this evening. She's pursuing leadership classes because she has also led professional development over the over the, um, the district in areas called B building thinking classrooms to design some of the work that we're talking about here. And, and of course, she's at Pearson. We're, we're fortunate she's there. But this is work that's, that's being worked on now. Ms. Morgan. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to talk about the absenteeism data. I was the person who asked you last year, like, how low can you go? Um, and if I recall, I think you were like, I think you sort of, I was like, I really pushed you because you didn't really want to give it. And I was like, you're, you know, like, where do you think it is? And I think it was like five, six percent, right? Was sort of like, that was sort of it. And and you're, you know, you're below six, which is is incredible. Um, the question I have about is the lowest performing group so first of all lowest performing is not a category that we that i like hear about a lot here which is fine um just from so i'm trying to figure out what's the tail and what's the dog here right a little bit so high absenteeism rates for that group are these the kids who were designated like are these the students who were designated as lowest performing this like last spring and then looking back at their attendance for last school year like, you, do you know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to figure out if if these are kids who were low performing in the spring of 23 and then missed a whole bunch of school. Yes. Okay. But so, but this is not a measure of the kids who missed. Correct. Who were low performing and because the lowest performing group is the one that moves, right? Like those because yes. like you move in and like you're not going to move in and out of a like demographic group, usually, right? Right. Yeah. But that there's going to be and and I mean low income and high needs. I mean low income maybe there's some movement in and out, but probably not to the same extent that we see in lowest performing. Is that accurate? Y yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, okay. I don't know what the rates of move in out. Low income actually can fluctuate a bit for families, and it can fluctuate significantly sometimes. Um, but yeah, they it, it shifts every year. It's the lowest quartile of performers, the lowest quartile. Right, yeah, I, I Googled yeah. it yeah. <laughs> while you were talking, because I was like, I don't, what is this? I don't know what that is. Okay, so those are the students who were the lowest quartile in the spring 2023 yes. MCAS administration, and then subsequently missed all of these days in the 23, 24 school year. Yes, and we have not been told who our lowest performing students of 2024 are. We could figure it out, like we could go do that analysis, but we usually find out who these students are in like January, <laughs> gotcha. and then they yeah, take yeah, the yeah. test in two months from then. Right, and then you have new ones. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, super, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Carden. Thanks, um, so when you say tutoring, are you talking about like tier two groups or, or what? Do you mean by that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> tier two groups after school. Last year we had eight um, teachers that wanted to tutor, and I worked with them to say what what areas do you see need in. Some of it was reading and writing. There were a couple groups in math. These are students that um, were using um, multiple pieces of data to say it might be a grade level below, even on the cusp of grade level, and asking their families, you know, if they would like to stay for an extra half an hour uh, twice a week. Um, we also partner with the after school because some of these students, actually most of them, were also in the peer space after school. So we were able to have them do some tutoring, excuse me, and then go into their regular after school programming. Great, thanks. So as we look at the MTSS 
structure that does seem a little bit different than what some of the other schools are, do, are doing, which, might, which is great. It looks like you're having, maybe, maybe it's not, I don't know, but it looks like you're having success. So mm -hmm. that's something we should off, you know, hopefully interrogate. Um, and then just on the data, so the, the high needs is low income students with disabilities and EL learners, basically, roughly speaking, economically disadvantaged is also thrown in there. Um, but you don't have the EL uh, on, the, on the chart. So it, it does look like, if you just look at high needs, that those are, that 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 group as a whole didn't really make that much progress. It's really just the low income subcategory. Is that your assessment? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Is there anything you're doing specifically to target that group, or is this sort of how it worked out? Well, <clears throat> I hope this answer doesn't sound canned, but I think that. Um, really focusing on the new uh, curriculum that we're using, all the components of them, the, the, the all block with the uh, materials that are uh, prepared for MLL students. I do think this is gonna translate to increased growth over the next uh, year or two. Um, I'm pretty sure it will. I think that the materials are, are good and we're learning them and um, I have confidence that um, over the next coming year or two, our students will um, begin performing at a higher than average clip in those areas as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Gittleson. I don't have any questions, but I'm not gonna let Pierce present without commenting. Um, as I think everybody knows, I have two children at Pierce in second and fourth grade. I feel extraordinarily lucky to have my children in that school. I hope everybody in Arlington feels that way about their schools. Um, and I can say, I told this to Dr. Homan earlier this week that I'm in and out of the school building pretty regularly, as you know. And I uh, mentioned to my child's second grade teacher yesterday, I have never heard this much at home about what is going on in the classroom since the new curriculum. The amount that my family has learned about schools in three different countries and the challenges they've faced has been like pretty remarkable. And I see how hard all of Everybody is working, or this is happening all over the district. But I, you know, I just want to second that there's no way that Pierce meets whatever Desi category it is they gave us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. <clears throat> I just had a question about uh, this is the first uh, SIP for us this year, and so I just want to make sure I'm clear. On, the, on the, the page three, you talk about the different categories. Is there overlap between these groups or are these unique students? So you have first language, not English, English language learner, low income, students with disabilities, high needs. Students can only be in one of those categories or are, they in, or are there students who are in both multiple categories? I'm sorry, Mr. Thielman, I, I don't know if I'm understanding your so question. You go to page three. On, on the slide deck or yeah. on the... And it yeah. says, title, first language, not English, 20%. English language learner, low income, students with disabilities, high needs. Are these? That's not this must be on your school improvement plan. Or that's, oh, that's the plan, rather. Okay. They are not mutually exclusive categories. So a student can be a second, uh, uh, an English learner and a special ed student uh, and uh, low income all at the same time. And included in all three groups. So in this, what I'm seeing here, okay, so what am I looking at? I'm looking at the presentation. The PDF. <coughs> so in that page, in that and that, it, th those students are, that's not unique students, it's people are in both, it's students are in both categories. It can be in multiple categories. Uh, Mr. Thielman, if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like to get back to you. I don't have that um, in front of me right now and I don't want to give you the incorrect answer. Okay, that'd be great. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, but I'm, yeah. Anyone else? The chair has a question. Uh, you're talking about conducting an empathy interviews. Could you elaborate on that? Tell me what that is. Yes, we were joined by um, Ms. Katie Hodgkins uh, last week. Um, her exact title, I'm unsure, but I know she's working in the DI, DEI BJ uh, department, mm -hmm. and she led our ILT in helping us understand what an, em what an empathy interview is, what it's not, and we um, began learning about ways that we could um, essentially meet with students to learn about their overall experience at school and really listen um, to what their experience is academically, non-academically, um, in order to provide a narrative in addition to numbers so that we can understand the student experience and perhaps the family experience in a way um, that maybe we do now but to systematize it a bit more. 
we met once and we are inviting her back to multiple ILT meetings uh, this year um, and then hoping to put together a game plan uh, to conduct these at school. Who conducts the interviews? I'm hoping that our members of the ILT uh, will, will take a lead in this. We're, we're planning on creating two subcommittees within our ILT, um, one to focus around the more academic-oriented goals in writing and discourse, and the other um, in the area. Uh, I, I would put this in a social-emotional mm -hmm. uh, learning category. And this is requiring some element of professional development support for your staff? Yes. Okay. It sounds interesting. Uh, perhaps we can learn more about it going forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Any further questions or comments from the committee? <coughs> um, Ms. Exton, are you happy? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up will be Thompson, Superintendent. Ms. Donato, is this the correct slideshow? Excuse me? Is this the correct slideshow? It is. Okay. Thank you. It's the one with the pineapples. Uh, well, right. It's definitely, if it's got a pineapple, it's definitely ours. Mm -hmm. So we've moved from the flamingos to the pineapples. Well, that, we thought it was nice teaming up. Felt so like a party. we got the tropical team today. It felt like a party, so. <laughs> Actually, there's a flock of flamingos in Stoneham, so, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, you mean at the zoo. zoo. <laughs> oh, you got me. As long as the water is warm, they're okay. <laughs> Temperature's good at Pierce, too, I hear. That's great. Well, thank you. Good evening, School Committee, Dr. Holman. My name is Karen Donato, and I am the proud principal in my 11th year serving the Thompson School community. Before we began, I had to make a note because I felt like I was going to forget to introduce our new assistant principal, who did not get any slides to present on, so I apologize. But Mr. Jeremy Greenwood, he is here uh, with us at Thompson, and he is uh, out there building relationships and connections with kids and staff in our community already, so we welcome Mr. Greenwood, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. I apologize for not being here the, the evening that um, the rest of the new administrators were here. I was uh, at the new open house format with uh, the rest of the Thompson staff. So, In his pineapple shirt, I should add, of course. Uh, so this evening, I would just like to go over our who we are as a school, what our priorities are for the upcoming school year. Some of the things that have gone really well are GLOWS and some of the areas that we continue to want to make progress in and then talk about a few of the things that we are hoping to utilize as resources to help with our success. All right. So we are a proud community of about 538 students with three waiting in the wings in registration currently and just over uh, 75 staff. Uh, some of the pictures here are about some of the community things that we do. There's Chalk the Walk, which you see are uh, pictures on the ground where multiple times students will come out and leave the staff messages. Students working collaboratively, collaboratively together in a kindergarten classroom there in the middle and our opening uh, day at Arlington High School. And I snagged a little picture of our staff under that cool, awesome balloon <laughs> arch. Um, but we value our partnerships with those members of our community and the services and the supports that we receive. This is a little bit about who we are. We are big, we are strong, we are uh, four sections at every grade level, 24 grade level classrooms. Um, I wanted to add the slide really specifying about our ML students. As we continue to grow, we continue to um, our diversity grows as well as the number of our students who are requiring ML support. Um, and actually those three students who are in the wings waiting are also ML students, so we will be just about five, uh, 50 ML students in a couple of weeks. And um, two of those students are SLIFE students, which means that they have had interrupted schooling and are also requiring additional support. Um, next slide, please. Before I dig into some of the areas of what we would like to work on to improve, I wanted to take a quick moment to really highlight the progress that we've made and how well, how well most of our students are doing. And I'm particularly proud of the student growth percentiles here. 
the left is our um, ELA scores from this year, and the right is our math. And student growth has increased, it's hard to see there, but 5.8% in ELA and 8.7% in math, which I think is significant. And, and um, our students and our staff are really working hard. And um, it's showing, which is great. I feel compelled, similarly to Mr. Amadi, we've worked really hard. And we, can, we have fallen into the category of needing target, targeted assistance due to some of our students with disabilities not participating in MCAS, yet our growth was 91%, so our, our account, accountability percentile. Um, so we continue to, to work hard and feel that it's important that our staff and our students get recognized for that. Thank you. This is just a slide kind of quantifying our four goals for the year, but the slides that are following after, we'll go through them just individually and talk about what are some of the steps we are. Uh, doing to meet those goals. Most of them, the four goals are similar. We've tweaked a couple of them just to kind of highlight where we are in this moment and some of the steps that we want to do um, to further support growth. So this slide talks about on the left-hand side is our ELA um, meeting and exceeding chart, and it also highlights the, our categories of students as white, Asian, Hispanic, black, and other. Um, last year, we had growth in our black population. This year, it has declined. Last year, we had a decline in our Hispanic population, and for this past year, it has, gr it has grown. So that's certainly an area that we want to take a closer look at. Um, our Dibbles scores, we are just slightly below the district average of 84% for our students in K through three who require targeted instruction. We are at 83%. Um, and if you take a look, Similarly to the profile at Pierce, our at and above students um, K through three is obviously larger than our well below and below average uh, below students meeting benchmark. Uh, we continue to target specifically K to two with some of our intervention in that area. And the right uh, graphic is our high needs population, and over time our performance in ELA this year it we can while we continue to under underperform the state's expectations with our high needs population. We had some slight growth in ELA this year, but it's been pretty stagnant, which is an area we really want to hone in on as well. This is our goal, um, talking about some of the strategies that we'd like to use, specifically focusing on our ML and special education students um, and talking Sorry. Then talking about some of the protocols that we are using to deepen student discourse and um, academic discourse, as well as um, taking a look at how our students are engaging in the classroom. Last year, excuse me, <coughs> last year we highlighted how, with all across all of our grade le levels, we were working for them to implement some of the EL protocols around student discourse, even though they weren't yet part of the cohort that was implementing the new curriculum. And what we found was that that certainly gave us a boost as we entered this year with full implementation. Um, but we are hoping that we would like to see an increase in student engagement with grade level tasks across all subject areas using those protocols and the high leverage practices, which can be tools for us to help deepen student academic discourse. We want to continue the practice of doing some instructional rounds and walkthroughs and take a look at obviously our students' performance on assessments and their experiences at our school. Uh, this is our strategic goal around culture and climate. We want to continue to improve belonging for all of our students. Uh, we did see a dip in some of our panorama data this year. Interestingly enough, we saw a dip in some of the student report, but yet we saw growth in some of the academic areas. Um, we also had, I think, some snafus with some participation on at a couple of grade levels. So we had 12 sections, three through five to take the survey, and I believe nine of the 12 completed it, so we didn't have a full picture. Um, so just a couple of snapshots. 57% of Thompson third through fifth graders uh, responded favorably when they were asked, how well do people at your school understand you? And I think that encompasses students and staff. So I think students are thinking of it from that perspective. 77% of Thompson third through fifth graders 
uh, responded favorably when asked, how much support do the adults at your school give you? And 68% of our third through fifth graders responded favorably to overall, how much do you feel like you belong at your school? Um, we recognize that it's important for our students to feel seen and heard and respected in all areas of our school from the moment they walk in the door, greeted by the adults, specialist classes, recess, school events within the classroom. Um, and that's something that we want to continue to improve as something that's a through line in all that we do, not just in these events that we have or these presentations or um, PTO enrichments that we bring into our school. To the right, you'll just see recently we had Len Cabral come in and do um, a storytelling, which was amazing because in this day and age where everything is a lot of technology, he literally just used his body, his voice, and the kids literally sat there so enthralled listening to what he was telling them. He's a Cape Verdean um, storyteller. And it was, it was so impressive to see them just sit and listen and engage with just someone in their voice. Um, and to the right is just a little snapshot of some of our students working um, in an art class. With, we call them, we used to call them uh, bingo daubers, but now there's Crayola art daubers. Um, next slide, please. So our absenteeism data, um, we want to improve belonging for our families. We want to improve our communication with them and some of the practices that we um, have established. And going back to some of the things that I feel like we used to do that we got away from, COVID times, and trying to, as we get bigger, figure out uh, what are some of the ways that we can uh, streamline some of the communication so that families at a particular grade level or a grade span are receiving communication in more of a consistent way. We've gotten feedback um, also that there's, you know, things might be happening in the younger grades very consistently and in the upper grades, communication fades off a bit as it has um, over time. One of our goals this year is to really focus on outlining what that plan is for our community and sharing that. Um, when we look at our absenteeism data, it continues to continues to be an issue for us. What I can say is that I, we know why our students are absent. It's not that students aren't coming to school and we're not being responsive to them, but our community has various um, needs and various um, profiles that there are times where families have to travel for an extended amount of time because it's their one opportunity to go to their country that they haven't been to. We just had a family that's headed off um, to Nepal for six weeks and they've never been, their children have never been, and I think families also recognize that if they're going to do such travel, now's the time to do it in the younger grades versus when they'd be failed for absences when you get to upper grades. Um, if we have students who are struggling to come to school, we are reaching out to those families. We are trying to find out what are some of the barriers in their students getting to school and creatively coming up with some plans if there are things that we can do that are within our control to do that. So some of our GLOWs, um, substantial growth in our overall accountability rating to 91% of our students are meeting and exceeding MCAS targets. Um, we continue to use our ACE time well to support our EL curriculum, discuss instructional practices, and have regular opportunities to review our data. Um, we have purchased 10, uh, they're called Pocky Talks, which are handheld translation devices that can go back and forth. Someone can communicate back and forth in your language and to English. And um, we've recently distributed them to different grade levels and different support staff, which is an ongoing effort to increase communication for our MML students and families. Um, we were graciously had the opportunity to hire an inclusion specialist position, and that really has led to some great targeted intervention. And in-class intervention, better allocation of both of our math and literacy intervention K-2, because we have Title I um, support as well. But adding the inclusion specialist has really um, kind of allowed us to have a person who is has the full picture of where we are with our intervention and attends regularly our SST meetings, our grade level ACE meetings, and um, the work that she has been able to do, I think is starting to show. We hired late in the year, just because there wasn't a lot of um, applicants 
at the time, but we were able to really hone in on what we wanted that to look like. We were building it as we flew last year, and I feel like we're in a really good spot with that position. Um, we changed our format for our curriculum night, which used to be families would come, the adults would come, and you'd sit in the classroom and teachers would do presentations, and depending on the time you might have, or the two different sessions we had, you might have 10 adults in your class, or you might have two. Um, and it just didn't feel like who we are and what we say we want for our community. And this year we made the shift to do a student-led open house, and it was awesome. Jeremy didn't have the experience of the former, but it, it was just, the building was alive. Families and extended families came, grandparents came with their children. Families were talking in their native language to each other and their kids and explaining things in the classroom. Um, and I think while there was some feedback, they, they, families were still missing some of that curriculum piece. We'll make an adjustment, we sent information out, but we are thinking about how we could make that also an adjustment for something that, for this night as we continue on. But it was so positive being a student-led opportunity um, that that for sure is something we want to keep moving forward with. We have great partnerships um, with our DIG. AEF has supported a DIG grant, which supports Read Across America Diverse Book Initiative. And if you go to the Read Across America website, there is um, lesson plans and topics to explore. And our PTO, our DIG, in conjunction with their AEF grant, is providing monthly books um, around diverse topics to all our classrooms. And again, supporting our initiative for students to feel seen and heard in all areas, not, not just isolated um, situations or events. And a small change that we made, which I think is having a big impact, is that our staff members who are not classroom teachers have been assigned to attend morning meetings with other classrooms, which we've preserved that 20 minutes in the morning. We haven't started our specialist classes um, or prep time for the classroom teachers. We've preserved that 20 minutes so that that's the time where the students are having morning meeting, building relationships with, with each other, their classroom teacher, and additional staff now who support and get to know students. We've gotten such good feedback on it. Teachers feel like, I didn't know the student before, and now they see me in the hallway and they'll say hello, or I'm, I've been the reading teacher and I really only work with my reading students, and now I have this whole other group of students that I know and that students know them, which again, further supports our desire to have students and staff feel connected and build strong relationships with the adults and each other in our building. All right, some of our grows um, continue to focus our outreach um, to some of our families who identify as low income, our Hispanic population, our African American population around what support is needed for them to decrease um, chronic absenteeism. We really want to get back to increasing opportunities for our caregivers to participate in student learning and, and come into the building a bit more during the school day so they have the opportunity to see what their students are doing in the classroom. Um, we also want to increase amount of time that we dedicate uh, time and space to meet with specific caregivers of populations, population caregivers, our ML students, our special education students, our students who identify as low income, our families who identify as low income or socioeconomically disadvantaged, and our families of color because we want to elevate their voices in our school community as well. Um, increased student support in student focal groups to address the achievement gap while in most of our categories, our students made some small progress. Um, we want to see more and we want to specifically figure out what are the levers that we can adjust so that those students are also making significant growth as we navigate um, their time here at Thompson. We want to conduct empathy, empathy interviews at least twice a year so that we have information kind of mid-year and then as we end the year so that we know from our students how they are experiencing school. While the Panorama Survey is a tool that can be used, we also recognize that that tool and student responses can depend on where they are in that moment or whether or not they really understand the question being asked or um, an interaction they may have had five minutes ago with someone that has led them to feel a certain way which has them respond in a certain way to some of the survey questions. Um, and we also want to increase our survey participation for both staff and families and make sure all of our student sections are taking it. So resources to ensure success. I think 
the ask for resources, um, particularly around strategic culture climate goal number three, also actually applies to the others. Um, but we appreciate our partnerships with our PTO and our DIG and um, funding of certain things that we want to do and resources and the enrichment that they bring into our school and thinking about our focal groups that might need some additional support, considering additional staffing um, in our budget request for next year to support services for students in those focal groups. Um, and in terms of family engagement in goal four, we want to again request that we ask for a staff member or someone to hire to be a family liaison for our families and our students. Um, Vicki Rose is our admin assistant. Jeremy and I also spend a lot of time at the front office and Vicki is one woman with 540 students and 80 staff to navigate daily and things come and are coming at us all day long in that area and we want to be able to have someone dedicated to respond to some of those needs um, in a way that's more systematic and targeted. So we want to look to request um, for a family liaison also as we continue to try to support our goals for the coming year. I just want to talk a little bit about some of these pictures. <laughs> um, a, a message I sent to the staff, I had with the staff at the beginning of the year was there's a lot of big things to do. And when we take the time to, to focus on the small things, um, I think that's where we get the biggest bang for our buck because those small things build the relationships, build the connections with our families, our students, and each other. And those then small things can lead to uh, bigger things happening. So that's the quote in the middle. To the right, um, one of the, at, one of our, at our opening staff meeting, we had opportunities to work in small groups, talk about our family engagement and communication goals for the year. Um, we also had the opportunity to play some fun games, which I think is important, which is the picture to the left. It's really important to have some fun, make some silly faces with our students and our staff. And that young man just happens to be the son of Mr. Amadi. That's easy. <laughs> My other option was to put the picture of him and his wife Amanda looking in the kindergarten window at drop off. I decided to go with this one. Um, but I do think, you know, that's, that's part of what we need to do, too. We can't forget that these are kids and they also, and, and adults, we need to experience the joy and some fun when we're at school. Um, to the left, that is a picture I took this year in a second grade classroom. And I think it speaks to, similarly to what Andrew was talking about, how this is a science activity. But a lot of the protocols and tools that we are working on in, in increasing student discourse has allowed for students to be able to have some productive struggle and communicate about it. This activity, it, they were given four pieces of paper, a certain amount of tape, um, and a ruler, I think. But they had limited supplies, and they had to figure out, they were working in partners, they had to have discussions with each other and try not, they couldn't get more paper, but they had to try different strategies to build something that would support at least a book that was one inch thick. And multiple students came up with so many different strategies that would support multiple books. And just watching it unfold and the struggle and the laughter and, the, and kind of the frustration and then the joy that came out of such an activity um, is really, I think, where we are and what we want for our students as they continue to learn and grow. And thinking of the staff who are also learning to kind of let that happen a bit. <laughs> and that's hard, too. Um, and the upper left is a couple of, there's a positive there and something we're going to hopeful, hopefully make some progress with. We were able to get a, a great kind of refresh of some of the grounds. Both of our school side playgrounds needed to be, the equipment needed to be removed because it was unsafe. So right now we have empty spaces that are usable now for playing in. And we were able to kind of get them spruced up with some uh, yard work that was done, which we are appreciative of. And we're hoping to somehow move forward with a capital request to get some new playground equipment at Thompson. But, so that is it. Any further comment from the superintendent? Of course. Um, <laughs> I love visiting Thompson School. It's one of the most joyful places to be in the district um, and one of the busiest with all of the students that they have there. 
Um, I think it's really exciting to see some of the progress in achievement that's been made uh, over the, this past year. I know that uh, in, at Thompson in particular, both because of size, but also because of need profiles, there can be a lot of challenges that are added on to new initiatives when we do something like roll out an EL curriculum. Um, they've made excellent use of the, in, uh, the uh, new intervention specialist role that you all were um, supportive of last school year, and it's exciting to see that take root and to think about how that could also be included in some of our MTSS efforts over the next several years. Um, and I also just want to commend the Thompson team for all of the outreach work that they're doing proactively in pilots with the Family Engagement Department to try out new tools, to purchase more of the Pocket Talks, and use those more often because they're helping us see what can be really impactful with families um, in sort of a test zone where we can then roll some of those, some of that work out to the full district, and it's been a very collaborative effort. Um, so thank you to the Thompson team, and I look forward to everything that's to come this year. <laughs> and welcome to Mr. Thank you. Um, and to the committee. Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, when I was reading through your presentation and, and hearing it now, uh, one thing that struck me, I mean, there were lots of things that I'm impressed by, but one thing was under the section on deepening student discourse. You mentioned the simple sentence frames that can transform discussion. And I just felt that the examples that you gave are things that are going to help kids in working in teams. And you know, it, it's, it's not, I mean, giving them the ability to say things like, I would like to build on Chantel's idea or um, I appreciate that idea, but I respectfully disagree. Just giving them and having them practice these things are going to make it much easier for them as they get into high school and are working in groups and don't have a teacher around all the time. I mean, I, I hope by that point it's kind of embedded. Um, and that's something that I've always felt that we needed somewhere in our curriculum and we didn't have and so I just wanted to flag I, I understand that's partly I think from the Thank EL you. but but still it did I think it's something that we should be aware of and, and uh, celebrate we're also seeing it work out in recess too which is helpful <laughs> recess some of those areas where you know, there's a larger group of students together and they're navigating some conflict or disagreement. So it's nice to also see it spread into those places where their classroom teacher isn't necessarily there to yeah. be right on. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Great, thank you. Um, so this was this was really helpful. I guess the, the feedback that I would have is that the, the absenteeism data is, is like, mm -hmm is really worrying, right? And all of these wonderful things that we're talking about, discourse, community, all of these fabulous pictures that you shared with us, the pineapples, right? Kids can't access those things if they don't come to school, if they're not there. And I guess, to me, it feels like we need to be, and I get that it's like nuanced and we don't wanna scare people and, and it, but, I guess I would like to see in that family engagement goal, like belonging, yes, but like, and I get that belonging drives participation, but like, I, it just feels like we've got to get really focused on this absenteeism. We've got to talk about it and, and, and it's going to take some time, right, to have those conversations with the families who, who are going to spend six weeks in November, you know, someplace else, right? And, and, and how do we, how do we, the royal we, right, as a community, like not like the two of you and your team necessarily, but like how do we as a community get better about talking about why it's really important to be in school, why we've got to be there, why like, you know, it, and, and we can embrace our, you know, you know, students and their desires to 
travel internationally and all those things, but like we really need them to be in school and we need them to try and do those things in July and August mm -hmm. when we don't have school. And I don't know how we get good about talking about that. Um, I'm sure you are all much better than I would be if I was having that kind of a conversation, but it just feels to me like we can't teach these kids if they're not in school. And I know we all know that. And um, so I guess I would like to see it be, try to develop comfort in talking about like absentee. And, and, and this was like very like transparent, obviously, I guess just in the goals, thinking about, you know, what do we want to see? Where, where do we want to see this, you know, what do we want these numbers to look like? Because we, we care about the numbers, but we really care about them being in school, right? So I guess that for me um, just seems like such a big thing, and I know that it is in the district, and I, I hope that we keep talking about it. And I think just for us too, as we've gotten bigger, you know, finding the routines and the structures of making this something, something that is monthly, you know, or whatever, that we're sitting down and taking a look and then the targeted <coughs> outreach specifically, again, every so many weeks to families, bringing them into the conversation again, having similar conversations. But as we've gotten bigger, I feel like that piece, we need to go back to doing it as regularly as we were when we were, you know, eight years ago, seven years ago when, when we were much smaller. Right, because, I mean, the chronically absent are our our biggest focal group, or they're not actually probably, right? Uh, there are a number of students in our focal groups who reflect or yes. reflected yes. by the chronic Yes, of course, of yes. But I mean, even of all students, we have 19, I mean, at Thompson, there were almost 20% who were chronically absent. I don't, we don't really have any other focal groups that are that big. I, what are you? Well, just, just as a general overall? percentage, right? Like tw if 20% of students were chronically absent last year, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty big percentage. Yes. Like there are not a lot of other mm -hmm. focal groups anywhere in the district that are 20% of our students, I don't think. Too many. Anyway, um, so yes. And, and I guess like, and, and everything, right? Like can we reach out to, you know, and probably this is already happening, can we work with those families, make sure that they're coming in for conferences, right? Can we schedule them first? Can we schedule them before we schedule everybody else, right? Can we, you you know already in mid whatever we are, October, who which kids are on track to be chronically absent, right, soon. Um, what are the things that we can do to, to bring those folks in? So thank you so much. Thank you. Superintendent. Um, I just want to note that I think that one of the big things we've been really focused on over the past year is building up the systems that allow for the easy tracking mm -hmm. of these data because it used to be before we had the dashboards that we just launched that they would need to pull these data, analyze it, look for trends, have the conversation with the family about the trends. And to boot, we don't have a system that automates a lot of the communication about this um, it has, we have a system that is able to automate some communication, um, but we need to strengthen district-wide our ability to, to alleviate the strain on schools like Thompson, Audison, Gibbs, high school, where there are so many more students that the individual outreach efforts, mm -hmm. what's, what's fr what can be frustrating about this is that it can be a vicious cycle because you have a certain number of students, you try to get your handle, a handle on it, your capacity gets strained, and you, you miss uh, a few students in the process of trying to target um, a small group if you have too many students. And so we're working on the district-wide systems that will make it easier for them to do a lot of that work at our larger schools um, and automate some pieces of the process, mm -hmm. knowing that a lot of it can't be automated because it's a conversation, um, and getting clear about it to our protocols for what happens when students go uh, travel internationally because you should, if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time, be enrolling a child in a school where you're going if it's a really extended period of time, which means unenrolling here. And so we need to get clearer about regulatorily what's allowed and what we're then requiring and what record we're gathering back from families while they're traveling internationally. And we're very close to having a solid protocol for that that we can communicate to the principals and then deploy. 
-hmm. It's great. It sounds like a lot of work. It'd be really nice if power school could do a lot of this for us, right? I mean, I just was hunting around in my power school being like, wonder how many times my kids have been absent. And um, it's quite remarkably hard to find. And I wish it was the kind of thing that like just hit me in the face as soon as I logged in. <laughs> Not so much. And I think, you know, Andrew had shared as our, at our principal team, you know, how he had structured it for himself and his team last year. And it's been really helpful to think of it in, even in the terms of, in the way that he did it. So that for me and, and Jeremy and our team, we're already going into it thinking, all right, this triggers this and this letter goes out. And even if we know why a student has been absent, it's the parent or the guardian gets the letter and they're like, hey, wait a minute, you knew. Yes, we did. And let's talk about what the impact might be, you know, or the greater impact is going to be. So I think that that's going to be also something that we want to make sure that we're doing regularly, which has been. But that kind of outreach yeah. is going to scale with the number of students, right? So yeah. like, I mean, mm -hmm. all respect due, right? It is easier to do that marginally with 300 students than it is with 400. Like it, <laughs> right. it, it literally, the, I mean, there, there are plenty of things in a school building that don't necessarily scale with number of students. This right. does. I would imagine because it is literally, it's like one Z, two Z. And that's also part Sorry. of thinking about, you know, if we were to have a family liaison position, that was certainly something that would fall under that category to help relieve some of that or take lead on some of those things too. So it's, it's all fine. And I, and I think to, to your point about this, the scale, um, the letters are all well and good. Yes, that they can be automated and we can, you know, trigger at certain numbers of absences. It's really the conversations that are going to make the difference mm -hmm. and having the conversations Frankly, you know, if you're having conversations with 20% of your population, you know, every week, um, that's taking up a lot of your time. Those are all very, very valuable conversations to have, um, but it's really hard to manage that on, on, on a weekly, weekly and daily basis. Yeah. Mr. Seelman. I'm on the same topic here. Jane covered a lot of this, so if I, my, my question, so to, Try to develop an outreach plan to 20% of the student body. There's a lot of mm -hmm. time, work, money, personnel. So, have you, which by the way, I'm not saying can't be done, mm -hmm. um, with the resources you have or with additional resources, I, I don't know. But the, if, what, just t talk a little bit about the, the conversations you've had internally about the why behind this, and maybe there's a way to address it um, by you know, structures, culture, systems inside the school, dynamic inside the school. That's what I'm kind of wondering about. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's so many, there are so many whys behind these numbers. Yeah, um, right and I also think we are still recovering from how families perceived COVID and the expectations around when your child is sick and, and not wanting to spread germs. I feel like that still plays into it with some of our families, whether that's cultural or um, just the, the family dynamic of, of makeup of some of our families. Um, I think as, as a team and as grade level teams and as special education teams and um, just our service providers in general, it's, we have students who experience um, single parents who are off to work before their child is up and gets to school. So there's time where we're saying, all right, we, we check in or, or our classroom teacher calls down and say, can you please make a phone call home? So-and-so is not in again today. So those are the things that trigger these responses um, and they're oftentimes tailored to particular students versus the system. And I think that's the piece that we need to take a look at and how do we incentivize our families and our students to come to school and recognize like, when we had a conversation with the family today, their student has had a lot of tardies, and we're pre by being tardy, we're perpetuating the fact that he's anxious about coming into school, and then he doesn't know where he's, what, you know, what's happening in the day when he gets there. He's already behind the eight ball, and just having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with that family and saying, "Tell us what that looks like at home for you. What can we do to support that?" And here are some of our, our ideas. Um, I think we that was a great conversation to have today with that particular family. And it's hard to replicate that in a timely fashion, I think, with the number of families that may be requiring that individual um, outreach. But I also think there's more, 
taking a look at like the structures and system that we have in place. I think that's a piece that we, we need to focus on, what that looks like for us at Thompson. Because I do feel like there's a lot of responsiveness around individual students and their absences and what their needs are. But when we look at it as a system, what are the things that we are sharing about the importance of being at school, like Jane had mentioned, and how not being at school on, on a day actually impacts the rest of the week. Like those are the pieces I think we need to be more specific about and taking a look at how we share that with the greater community. Um, yeah, because just to, just to, if, to play this out, if in a month or two or three months or whenever we start talking about the budget, you start you would advocate for an additional position within the school to try mm -hmm. to address this. The first question that some of us might have is, have you thought about the systems and structure inside the school first before you ask for an additional FTE right. or something or half FTE, whatever it is? But that's what I'm trying to get at. Thank you. Okay. And that's Super, yeah. the superintendent come in. I just want to share that um, whatever you're doing so far this year is working quite well because your chronic absenteeism rate is 9.6%. No, so you don't need the position. Compared to this time we'll last year. We'll take it right now. We'll take it where we are. So, oh, it's because you're from this year. Clearly, okay. <laughs> well, that, Clearly principal. <laughs> assistant principal. Um, well, okay, so maybe that's it. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Yeah, I'm just, because we are well, looking at last year's data. Fair enough. And also thinking like cohorts of students, okay. right? Like I, I can specifically think of some students that have graduated that contributed to this particular percentage, right, from last year and, and where we are this year. And even though we're, like, we're up 15 or 20 students more than we had last year, it's nice to hear that particular <laughs> piece of data. And also, I still think there's work to be done about how we message around the importance of coming to school, some of the supports that we can offer or help families navigate some of the challenges that they may, fe may be facing. When it comes so essentially, to the superintendent just undercut any argument you might have. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> we have, we have, we have data it's now. It's great. One part. Of oh, job. OK. So Only that's, one part. <laughs> I'd like to go to that meeting. So that dynamic <laughs> I'm advocating for a satellite registration in okay. East Darlington. But really, I'll start with the family liaison. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Dr. Carden. Yes, just, just a quick um, point on, a note on that point. Um, Mr. Korski is not here. But as we do, we have the largest elementary school and the smallest elementary school here tonight. And we had some issues with position control last year. But one thing I will be looking at this year is the balance of resources between those two schools, making sure we have the right balance. Mm -hmm. Reasonably so. Can I throw a point in? Because I, no, no, yeah, I think it's an important piece of this conversation that it hasn't been mentioned, and maybe it's a good thing that it hasn't been mentioned, but Thompson has double the number of low-income families from, from the school at district average. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about absenteeism, when we're talking about health, when we're talking about access to resources, when we're talking about childcare and transportation, we have, that has to be a piece of the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. And that's beyond the control of the school. Thank you for saying that. And I think... You know, I'm really proud of the work that we've done and the progress that we've made. Mm -hmm. And people ask, like, what's our special sauce or whatever <laughs> you had said. Uh, and, and I think part of it is, too, our, our staff, we have, and I'm not saying anything about other school, we have staff that have been at Thompson for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And when we approach what our students' needs are, we approach it from the shoes on their feet, the food in their belly, mm -hmm their academic needs and their family needs. And I think that the work is hard and we may have that in larger numbers at Thompson. And I know it exists at the other schools, but I think that that's a huge piece of it, the way that we approach our families and our students and what their needs are. Um, and I think too, our staff overall feels really positive about the work that we do and the support that they get. And I think we remember that they are also people outside of the job that they are doing um, so that when things arise, I think they feel respected as professionals and also as people in our community and by their administrators, which I think also perpetuates their positivity when it comes to the work that they're doing. So it, everything is just so connected. There's just not, I think, anyway, all the pieces have to come together to keep moving forward. Any other members of the committee? I have a couple of questions. First of all, how long have you been at Thompson? This is my 11th year. 12 oh. years ago. I still feel new. 12 <laughs> years ago, do you remember what the population, how many students were in the school 12 years ago? When I started, we were 383. I remember that number. 12 years ago, it was 326. Okay. We were opening or planning for the new building. Uh, it was about the time of the opening. We, op we opened the building in, in 2012, I believe. 
or 13? 13. 13. State was in here looking at us and saying, are you sure you can fill this school? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We went from 326 to where, where are you now? 540, did you say? Oh, almost 540. 530? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The community loves your school. If you build it, they will come. That's yeah. what I'm <laughs> the community has always loved it, but the love is intensified. Superintendent's going to give a report after you're done talking about redistricting again. Okay. Uh, and one of the things we did when we set set forth the bumper bu buffer zones was to expand them to bring more kids into Thompson. And I think we're probably going to have to look the other direction now. Um, uh, people love your school. Uh, I've got a couple of quirky questions. First of all, fourth grade ELA MCAS. Mm -hmm. I've never seen an idea development score as high as yours. Any comment? How'd you do that? I don't, I don't know the special sauce on that one. <laughs> um, I think, again, I feel like that particular team, our fourth grade team, the way that they function is, um, and that, again, not speaking ill of other teams, but all our kids are all our kids, um, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of uh, mixed up activities where it's not, if you need support in this particular area in writing or math, they will do mixed up groups. Mm -hmm. So not just Omas oh, Armstrong's class, stay in her class the whole mm -hmm. time. If there's a particular area that, because they're constantly looking at their student work, their student data, consulting with the math coach, the ELA coach around what can we do to move these students forward. And they take risks like that by mm -hmm. saying, all right, today we're working on this, we're going to divide our students up or this week mm -hmm. in this way, and they're going to receive their instruction based on where it is that we see that, they, that there's the need and go to different classrooms for that support, okay. not just their home classroom. I, I just wanted to know that because I've spent years analyzing MCAS data. I've never seen anything like that. Never seen a score that high in, in that content area. My, my other question is sort of a quirky, quirky question. It really doesn't go to you. It's really sort of one to hang out there that maybe someone from one of the elementary schools or uh, curriculum will have the answer to it. It could be just a peculiarity of the test. Question 24 on the third grade MCAS is a constructive response question. It's the only constructive response question in the third grade, which makes it quirky and subject to statistical error, and we know that we can't rely on it, any one <coughs> instrument in a test or anything about the test to, to make a final determination, but it sort of leads me to the I wonder why this is the lowest performing question in the district overall, when when we look in the aggregate we do so well, both in ELA and mathematics on open response kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So I don't expect you to have the answer to that. I'm just throwing that out in the atmosphere right now because this is the safest place to do it after complimenting your idea development <laughs> so that somewhere along the line between now and the end of this whole process, uh, somebody can whisper in my ear what was wrong with that question because I, I, I believe it's probably the quirkiness of the question and not the competence we'll of the teacher. It's a strange it is yeah. a strange question. Sure. It's, write a paragraph that explains how title connects the ideas for the passage using important information from the passage. Write a paragraph. It's a weird question. And so, you know, I do a sort, I play, I download the data, I mess with it, and I looked at this, and what's going on with this silly question? Okay. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Superintendent, any further comments? Not at all. Thank you so much for all the work all of you have done um, last year and that we're going to work on this year. Thank you for your continued support. We appreciate it. Obviously, we, we had two really great schools to kick us off. We did. Um, and thank you to uh, Ms. Clement and Mr. Greenwood. Welcome to your first school committee meeting. Uh, and I hope you find happiness coming here again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We now go to the buffer zone report as previewed. All right. Are we buffer zone or evaluations? Sorry, oh, superintendent's evaluation is next up. Okay. Uh, we'll do superintendent's evaluation materials okay. first. All right. I will be brief, but I want to quickly orient the committee to the materials that I have sent um, via email. 
I'm happy if, as you're going through those materials, you're interested in having additional evidence um, to provide that for you. So just feel, feel free to reach out and let me know. Um, I want to roll through a little bit of information, um, including an overview of the process, a review of what the goals were for this past school year, um, highlight some of the evidence that's provided, uh, and give a couple of my reflections, and close up with a discussion about the evaluation cycle and any questions that anyone on the committee has. Um, just as a reminder of process, I set a student learning goal, professional practice goal, and superintendents are asked to set one to three district improvement goals. I set two this past year. Those were established last school year, voted in January by the school committee. In addition to the goals themselves, I added performance measures, which are selected to directly or indirectly measure the progress towards those goals. Those can be quantitative or they can be more qualitative, like artifact-based. Um, it kind of depends on the goal, which of the uh, types of data I've provided or artifacts I've provided. There are also standi standard indicators on the DESI rubric. Um, and I select those during the goal setting process. So down here along the bottom are the four standards for leadership for superintendents on the DESI rubric. And in each one, I've selected two standard indicators for the committee to focus on in determining ratings. The committee will rate progress on the student learning goal and the professional practice goal um, along the scale of no progress, some progress, significant progress, meeting or exceeding, and then rate uh, my performance in the four standards based on the selected standard indicators. So. Um, the student learning goal for last school year was to close our opportunity and achievement gaps for students uh, through focus on instructional practice and inclusive classroom systems and structures, some of which we heard about this evening. Um, there were performance measures listed there and the standard indicators that were aligned with those performance measures. I just want to share a little bit of the evidence and outcomes um, from those goals aligned with the performance measures. Uh, we're really proud of the district accountability designation that I shared at, during the outcomes report last week with all of our schools in the 80th and 90th percentiles in the state, and we had five schools that were above that 75% progress mark that was one of the performance indicators in the goal. Um, we had accelerated growth in elementary ELA for our focal groups comparing when you compare 23 and 24. Um, for the district-wide uh, meeting or district-wide ELA performance, we had we went from 40.6 to 49.8 um, in growth for multilingual learners, from 45.2 to 48.7 uh, in growth for students with IEPs, and from 43 to 50.7 for students in low-income households. When you look at elementary ELA growth of our focal groups. Uh, we had significant improvements in the experience of students in some of our focal groups, particularly students who identify as transgender from 22 to 24, which was one of the performance measures, and more competitive academic outcomes when you compare to the town manager 12 districts and statewide in multiple levels and content areas. Uh, we do, I do have some reflections in this area as well. We're really proud of our intentional growth uh, work and our leadership development and our focus on instructional improvement across the system on the fact that we've done a lot of digitizing our processes to get bureaucracy out of um, the central focus of some of our administrators so that they can focus on administration of teaching and learning. And we're really proud of our implementation of some of our budget processes and our hiring processes to improve the transparency of decision making and some of the strategic planning we've done to support our long-term goals. We still have work to do when it comes to student learning, including ensuring that we give students access to grade level and higher standards, uh, that we are including our students in focal groups in that access to grade level and higher standards whenever possible, and that we're giving students as much support as they need to attain mastery, and we're doing that as an add-on, not as instead of, because that's going to deny that access. Uh, we are working on maintaining our momentum through some challenging transformation work. I can't say that a lot of the work aligned with the student learning goal has been easy. <clears throat> it has been exceptionally difficult. Rolling out this new per curriculum at the speed we have has required a lot of work. Um, but we're very proud of that work. We just want to make sure that we sustain it and that we can maintain our energy towards it um, and be patient with one another and while we're doing things like challenge assumptions and building coherence. Um, and we need to make some of these new practices more routine while we continue to streamline some of the distractions so that our focus can stay on student learning. So those are some of the reflections I provided around the student learning goal. For the professional practice goal, the goal was to build the capacity of APS leaders and myself to use frequent informal and formal feedback from the community, staff, and students to inform our response to conflict and thoughtful and inclusive design of initiatives. 
Um, upon reflection, the the performance measures for this goal and the goal <laughs> itself are, are a little indirect. Um, and that's challenging because what the goal states is actually really hard to measure. Um, and so I do think that the data for this goal do indirectly to some extent perhaps measure it, but could also be measuring a lot of other things. Uh, but the evidence and outcomes I provided um, are that we have established a baseline for tracking uh, our goals when it comes to staff demographics. We've asked staff to proactively identify or not in their onboarding surveys uh, what some of their identifiers are, and that allows us to calculate retention for focal groups moving forward um, in some of our staff subgroups, and that was one of our goals for this year. Uh, our staff are continuing to diversify and represent a broader cross-section of experience. Along with that comes learning how to work in a diverse workplace, and sometimes that can be challenging. And so we have seen our belonging data sort of level off, um, but we've also seen staff report that they feel really connected to their immediate colleagues. Um, they are also reporting feeling slightly less overwhelm and stress. So they have um, to some of those questions that we hope they say, I don't feel super overwhelmed or I don't feel exceptionally stressed out. We do see them reporting a little bit less of those things, which is positive. And we know that it can be really hard to do this work in a sustained way. And that that building momentum piece I said for the previous goal is not easy to do. And so I think staff are feeling the, the stress of that. Uh, we hope it is productive struggle, um, but we know that that's going to be part of the work that we're doing together. Um, some reflections, we need to go about interrogating negative trends and staff well-being from fall 2023. We're gonna resurvey in this category. We hadn't resurveyed in this category at the end of last year, but it is on the survey we're doing right now. And so we're gonna keep an eye on that and then have um, some intervention work that we might need to do if we're seeing that well-being is still struggling uh, for our staff, especially given some of the new benefits that we're excited to have rolled out this year. We wanna continue building our mentorship, onboarding, and development opportunities for our newer staff and all members of the team, focus administrator professional learning on <laughs> calibration of expectations and on their skill when it comes to providing timely and actionable feedback to educators following uh, watching of instruction, we want to refine our procedures for hiring and tracking of the experiences of newer staff, particularly staff in, your, in years one through five, which is where we're seeing the biggest gap still in sort of belonging and connectedness to the work, um, and refine uh, our work to engage staff in inquiry-based, data-driven um, discussions and learning in sort of their day-to-day -day work in their embedded professional development. And then we had two district improvement goals. One was focused on expanding and improving two-way engagement. One was focused, or with families, one was focused on um, expanding deeper learning principles and providing more opportunities for deeper learning for APS staff and students. Um, I will be quick about evidence and artifacts here. These are just snapshots from some of the data that's provided on the website um, with all of the evidence. Uh, we recently had students lead a debate at the high school on uh, Massachusetts ballot questions two and five, which was really exciting. We're doing more and more things like this where we're asking students to lead exciting events that engage their peers or invite community members in to have rich discussions about relevant topics with students. We do this at the middle school level already with our civics day on a regular basis, and now this is something that's happening at the high school. Um, we did see some improvements in family experiences with communications uh, at 8th, 9th, and 10th grade, but we're still working on improving communications at 6th, 7th, 11th, and 12th grade. Um, and even where we saw improvements, we could do a lot more improving. Um, and so Dr. Jenger has been really purposeful about thinking about how he communicates with families more routinely this year. Um, and we're working with the new middle school principal at the Audison, as well as with Madame Pierre Maxwell on improving our approach to communication so that it's predictable, timing at certain times, that families know what to expect, and that it is purposeful, and they can feel like they can get the information they need when they need it um, and respond in a timely manner. We have seen a significant increase also in elementary performing arts participation, which is very exciting, um, and we have new initiatives that are starting up uh, where we're doing tutoring or peer mentorship across schools and across grade levels um, in multiple spots, which is also exciting and evidence of expanded deeper learning and experiential learning for all of our students. So um, what we're going to keep working on, I'll, I won't go through what we're proud of. You can look at that in the evidence. Some things we're gonna keep working on with respect to these goals is improving our approaches to family communication especially when it comes to contentious issues in order to identify what common ground may exist and build mutual respect. 
We're going to continue to revise um, and refine our one-way communication and procedures. We've done a lot of work on the website to make it easier to navigate. That continues, um, and it is getting considerably easier and more consistent to find information on the website. Uh, we are building our shared understanding of our approach to deeper learning by doing more public celebrations of student work. Some of that will continue here at school committee because we have students who have done some really exciting uh, work that they'd like to share with you that we're hoping to share in some of these meetings. And we're going to be focusing on professional learning that will build some of that coherence and understanding of the best practices that we do have in the district. We heard tonight about some of the things that work to improve it attendance. We are making sure that where we see those wins and we see those outcomes, that we're making, that we're reflecting on that, we're sharing that, we're having schools go and visit one another, and we're making expectations that reflect what we know works for our students. Um, so those are some overall, uh, reflections on the evidence that you'll see on the website and some of the reflections that go along with each of the improvement goals, the student learning goal and the professional practice goal. I did want to raise that um, we've done this once a year in my first three years and I am now in my fourth year, at which point you all have the option um, if you're interested in taking it up of having me present summative evaluation materials and collect them every other year as opposed to every single year. Um, it is an option that I wanted to make sure that you were aware of. I would uh, like the ability to receive formative feedback from the committee on a routine basis um, and to collect summative data with a longer cycle, if only because some of the work we do takes a while to manifest itself in outcomes and results. Uh, and that longer cycle can be useful in demonstrating impact. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Generally speaking, when we uh, engage in discussion about superintendent evaluation techniques or cycles, we do that through the uh, policies and procedures subcommittee if uh, the subcommittee would so desire to think about that uh, going to the future. That, that's the logical first step for that. Uh, any questions or comments on, on oh, let, let me just say two things that, uh, uh, the formal evaluation will be presented to the superintendent in a public meeting uh, at the December 5th meeting. We only have one November meeting uh, this year. Uh, so our November meeting is on the 14th of November. That will give you till November 14th to submit back to me your evaluation. And if you're running into trouble, uh, I can give you a little grace on that. Uh, I will send out, there's a new DESI form for that. I'll send you out the form uh, in the next day or two. Um, any questions or discussion on the part of the committee? Mr. Thielman. Yeah, so I think it would be good to take up the superintendent's recommend, uh, request for the evaluation. So is that, you want it directed to your committee, to the Policies and Procedures Committee? That's where we traditionally handle that. Okay. I mean, if you want to make a motion to ask them to do that, or I, I think that the uh, committee chair hears the uh, you want a motion? interest. Uh, if there's interest in discussing it, I'm happy to have the committee dis subcommittee discuss it. Mm -hmm. There's interest. Do you need a motion to do it? or do <laughs> Is there interest for more than one person? Oh, okay. Uh, no one else. Who else is on the committee? <laughs> Me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will discuss it. Okay. Great. Any other questions or comments? Ah, Ms. Morgan. I think I was the one who said, I really want to be able to do this evaluation without a calculator. And I really think that I could do that this year, which is like, mm -hmm. I have been on this school committee for like, a long, not long time, not as long as Ms. Donato has been at Thompson, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I have never been able to do it without getting my own calculator out, and I think I can do that. So thank you. It That's was a fair fantastic. request. <laughs> uh, and that comment from a statistician. <laughs> Any other questions or comments on the superintendent's evaluation? Okay, seeing none, we move on to the next item, which is the buffer zone report. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about buffer zones. So uh, I'm going to go over 
just as a reminder to everybody uh, what this report is and why. Um, and then we'll talk about buffer zone assignments for 2024 uh, by schools and grade levels, uh, do a class, quick class size overview of where we stand on class sizes for 2024. I want to briefly show um, some of the shifts we're seeing in demographics across the district and talk about enrollment trends and some of our next steps. I also have been able to complete a buffer zone retroactive analysis um, of assignments for this year, have a few reflections to share on that process uh, to inform what could be some ongoing conversations about whether or not we want to explore any adjustments of buffer zones, particularly surrounding the Thompson, um, given some of the conversations we had about size earlier this evening. So just as a reminder, um, buffer zones are around all of our elementary school district boundaries. They are areas where the elementary school district gets assigned to either one of those immediate elementary school districts uh, during the process of registration. They are assigned by me, taking into consideration um, the family's needs, whether or not they're siblings at the existing school. So the policy also states that I will report to the school committee on the implementation of that policy and its effectiveness. Um, with a focus on class size equity and how the policy is impacting and working towards improving that. So um, this is a slide that I've used each year. It demonstrates for each school how many st students or families were assigned that school as their first choice, um, buffer zone school as their second choice, and then the total number of students assigned to that school as their buffer zone assignment. Um, and it also has those same numbers for the previous year and a comparison of how many f students in that buffer zone or were assigned to that school from a buffer zone compared to the previous year. So uh, what, one of the things that I think it's important to notice is that for the most part, um, these track with the previous year with a few exceptions. We had more students uh, assigned to Stratton out of a buffer zone than in previous years, and we had more students assigned to Pierce. Wait, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, considerably more students assigned to Pierce from a buffer zone than we have in previous years for the most part. These are otherwise tracking somewhat close um, to previous year assignments. And uh, the numbers are tracking relatively similarly to what they have in previous years. So we haven't, we did have a lot more students in buffer zones this year than we did last year, um, and than we ever have also. And so that is, I think, actually reflective of a pretty mobile population over the course of this past summer. We had a lot more people move. Um, and, and new enrollments, though I'm still teasing out the data on that and how true that is compared to pre-pandemic. Um, I'm not sure if that's sort of a return to normalcy or if that's an anomaly that just more people moved into buffer zones themselves. I'm still working through the extent to which that's actually a um, demographic trend of move-ins, move-outs, but we did have a lot more families moving into and out of buffer zones this year than we did last year. So this is the grade level breakdown. Um, and so this is showing at each school in grade kindergarten, of course, there are the most students assigned um, from buffer zones. And then in grades one through five, how many students from each school were in a buffer zone and therefore assigned to the school from within the buffer zone. Um, a lot of these are siblings of another student that might be a kindergarten student because it's a move in. And so the kindergarten student and maybe there's an older sibling in the grade. Um, that was also in that same buffer zone and so was assigned. This is a class size analysis. I provided this also last year. And so the blue um, boxes are indicating a decrease in the average class size of more than two students from last year to this school year. The yellow boxes are indicating an increase in the average class size um, of more than two students from last year to this school year. Notably, we had more kindergartners than were projected in our projections, the projections that we have available to us this school year, um, and that our class sizes were very, very tight uh, at kindergarten as we moved through the summer and into this school year. One of the priorities that I've placed in doing the budget is to maintain classes of no more than 25. Um, to try to maintain classes of about 20 to 25 and to plan for sections around that number. 
um, and that has freed up resources as we've moved a lot of students from the elementary schools into the middle and high schools for us to be able to allocate those resources at the middle and high schools without compromising service staff at the elementary level, which has enabled us to decrease caseloads. So that budgetary set of decisions has had a big driving impact on some of the class size trends that you might see here. Um, we've also reduced some sections as we've gone along at some schools where we've seen either attrition of student population at that school or there's been a sort of consistently low class size at that grade level. We may have collapsed a section or two to realize some funds that would allow us to keep other resources at the school or would allow us to move some resources to the secondary school. I wanted to quickly highlight some of the district demographic trends that we have um, and that we're starting to see across the district. Uh, most notably, I wanted to point out that if you take a look at some of our, at, at our sort of school demographics, um, right now, actually, Stratton is the most racially diverse school, uh, elementary school in the district, excepting Monotomy Preschool. Um, which is exceptionally diverse as a school and is set up to be that way. Um, and then also, if you look at sort of across our elementary schools, they track pretty closely with one another. Um, and we have slightly less racial diversity amongst our secondary schools and particularly Arlington High School. Um, but I wanted to point that out because I think it highlights that the district is continuing to become more diverse and that's even further highlighted if you take a look at our <coughs> kindergarten and grade one and two <coughs> classes that these are the most racial and ethnic racially and ethnically diverse classes that arlington has mm -hmm. in the district um, and that this is a reality of sort of the world right now and it is something that will have an impact um, in an ongoing way on our the need profiles that we need to serve and i want to sort of be careful about how i'm saying that because i think this is one set of demographic data but it is reflected in other sets of demographic mm -hmm. data um, and it is also reflected in our outcomes we have um, a wider range of of outcomes that we need to then respond to we have a wider range of needs that we are responding to with interventions we have um, a wider set of challenges that families bring to us when we're talking about things like chronic absenteeism, everything from the need to travel internationally and stay connected to family to the need for transportation or someone to walk the kids to school. Or, and, and that vast range requires us to be exceptionally flexible. And so I, I think this is tied to the larger conversation about how we go about adjusting things like boundaries and assigning students to buffer zones, mostly because there are a number of things I will consider in doing these assignments. So yes, siblings is in the policy. That's the first consideration. If a student has a sibling uh, that already goes to a school, we're not going to split the family up and send them to two different schools, and that's go that student's going to go to the school where their sibling goes. But we also, I also get an increasing number of families who will put into their sort of reason or note about constraints, about the familial constraints that will impact attendance at school. And I'm thinking about that in making assignments. That is a consideration. It's not written into the policy as something that's, that's exceptionally high priority, but it, it makes a difference for families when they get assigned to the school that's closest to their home, um, when they get assigned to a school where an older sibling who's at another, at one of the secondary schools, for example, can walk the sibling to school on their way. Um, and those considerations are playing a role and are a factor as well in uh, some of the decisions that get made around buffer zones as we as we make those decisions. So uh, a couple of trends to highlight. There were more buffer zone assignments in 2024 than 24-25 uh, than in the previous year. Um, this year, 22.3% of new kindergarten enrollments were buffer zone enrollments, and last year, 19.8% of new kindergarten enrollments were buffer zone enrollments. It's not a huge shift, but it is a shift. Um, there were efforts made. I, I, I balance as I go, but, but I do make efforts as I go to swing away from Thompson District due to those anticipated space constraints. So there were 21 requests for Thompson. Um, all but four of those were made in the February and March 2024 uh, zone where families needed to request their buffer zone before the priority assignment gets done. So that's the after school enrollment deadline that we set with the after schools and we make an agreement that I'll do a round of buffer zone assignments 
before that so that people can enroll in after school so that we don't have people enrolled in multiple after schools um, across the board because that makes for confusion for the after school programs. It's easier for us to assign to after school if more families apply <coughs> ahead of that deadline and then get their buffer zone assignments. Otherwise, if they're in a buffer zone, they'll apply to both. Um, so there were 21 requests. Most of those were done in February and March. Um, five had siblings attending Thompson. 12 were ultimately over the course of the full buffer zone assignment period approved for Thompson. The last approval at Thompson happened in May. No more happened after that. Um, there were significantly more buffer zone assignments in grades one through five. Uh, there were 48 in 2024 compared to 11 in 2023. Um, and then, and that was also that was significantly more than in years prior. I went back and did that analysis, uh, which was one of the things that made me wonder about movement into and out of Arlington, accounting for higher enrollments compared to projections. The change in demographic profiles also suggests some movement um, of the population in town. Overall, we've maintained a lot of our commitments to reasonable class sizes. They're up overall, mostly within one student on average. Um, there are 14 grade level teams that had an increase in class size this year compared to last year and 10 that had a decrease in class size this year compared to last year. So the retroactive analysis goal of this was to take a look at what would have happened if we had made different, if, if I had made some different budgeting um, recommendations at the start and with the goal of relieving the student population at Thompson and keeping class sizes as near to 20 as possible. So there was a, what we did was a retroactive adjustment of the buffer allocation from, it's actually 24, 25, but like from last spring to now. So it's this year's students, this school year's students, and honor that sibling policy. So we couldn't adjust buffer allocations for any students who had siblings. We moved as many from Thompson as possible into schools and sections at other schools to get as close to 20 as we could. We tried to move also as many into Pierce as possible, assuming an added section. So we assumed an added section at Hardy and an added section at Pierce, and then shifted the assignments in sort of a perfect world, imagining that we had all the information as I was going along, as I do now, which is not real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to emphasize that. Um, th this is a perfect world sort of exercise. Um, and I think that some of what this suggests is that some redefining of the buffer zone would be needed to make a significant difference for Thompson over time, but that some difference can be made for next year. And there's some more analysis that I'm doing right now about when students in district enroll that will help with some of that decision making. And I'm doing that by school. So in other words, I'm trying to look at Actually, let me just show you this and then I'll explain what I'm doing next. So what this is showing, I'm going to try really hard to explain this in a way that's clear, um, was that these are the sections here. So we imagined that instead of efficiency as the goal, instead of section and budget, I don't like talking about kindergarten class sizes as efficiency as a parent of a kindergartner. I just have to say that out loud. Um, but. It is something that I have to think about in this role. So instead of that as the primary driver of sections for kindergarten, what I did here was say, what if Pierce had a third section and Hardy had a fourth section and we reassigned all of the students we possibly could to Hardy from Thompson who were in that buffer zone and didn't have a sibling. The reason this didn't happen when we got our initial set of buffer zone assignments this past year is that when we got those buffer assignments, I actually did do the exercise of saying, okay, nobody's going to Thompson. Everybody who's in the Hardy Thompson buffer zone gets assigned to Hardy. But then as soon as I did that and then looked at the section size, it was astronomical. We would have had to add another section at that time. And so instead of doing that, I looked through the requests and, and requirements and some students um, balanced at that time. And so this is how this has gone over the last several years is the balancing happens all throughout the buffer zone assignment process. But what that doesn't account for is the rate of enrollment in the school's home zones over the course of the summer. So the question I'm digging into right now is what is the rate of enrollment in the home assigned zone 
over the course of the summer? And can that rate be informative when it comes to when and how I'm assigning buffer zones in order to avoid needing to add another section proactively? Or should we anticipate the potential of needing another section at Hardy, for example, proactively um, and plan for that eventuality, shifting more students into that school early and being ready to put another section there if needed in order to alleviate what ended up being a tough situation at the Thompson. It's a lot of words to say something that's mm -hmm. a pretty complicated process. Um, but this exercise shows that had we done that, had we basically said, had planned for an additional section at Harding, an additional section at Pierce, which is not without its financial implications, uh, which are pretty significant, um, then we would have been potentially at section sizes that look a little bit more like this um, at this time, this school year, okay? So they would have been closer to that 20 to 25, 20 to 23 is what we would prefer zone at all of the schools. Um, and then there's a little bit of shifting also into that third potential section of Pierce from Dallin and Stratton. And the arrows are indicating the assignment shifts that we would have made from this number to another number at that school. Does this make sense? Okay, good. So then there's a little bit more rebalancing that you could potentially do at some of these schools um, to keeping in mind um, sibling constraints by moving students from Stratton to Bishop, from Bishop to Brackett, where some of the section sizes were a little bit higher. And so that would happen also along the way uh, because that balancing is also happening along the way. Um, one of the things I have learned from doing this for a few years is that you sort of commit to your strategy early and stick to it. So at one point, we had a situation at Stratton where the, we didn't have an art room if the number of sections of kindergarten was four. And at the start of that year's buffer zone assignments, we budgeted three sections, and I really wanted to see if we could get the art room. I committed to that strategy, and we were very tight at Bishop that year in kindergarten. And we definitely had three sections worth of kindergartners at Pierce because all of those students were shifted out of that Stratton zone to enable the reduction of sections. Whatever the strategy is going to be, it's important mm -hmm. that I have a sense of what it is mm -hmm. at the beginning of kindergarten enrollment. I do think it is imperative <laughs> that that strategy have something to do with reducing the pressure at Thompson. If we're looking at, and I think we're not, we're not looking at making major adjustments to any zone assignments at the start of next school year. With that in mind, this needs to be part of the strategy. And I think if we want to create <coughs> ongoing relief of pressure, we should take a really close look at whether or not it makes sense to expand that Hardy-Thompson buffer slightly. Um, and we also need to then think about what are the potential implications for schools that are neighboring to either of the schools, Bishop or Hardy, um, on the other sides of those buffer zones. So it was a lot of words about a lot of numbers. Um, I think some of our next steps are uh, to share with all of you some of the five-year weighted average projections that the Director of Data and Accountability has been developing. He completed those this week. Uh, so we have that. We're sending that to long-range planning. Um, these numbers are challenging to understand because our projections tell us that we should be going down in enrollment, and we are not. And so the projections for next year say that we're down next year. The projections for this year said that we're down this year. We're not. So um, it's a little difficult to interpret some of that. So as a result of that, we are getting quotes for long-range projections to be conducted by a vendor um, that we're hoping we can have some strong faith in. Uh, we have a couple of different possibilities that we're considering right now. Um, and I'll have more updates on that once we've had a chance to talk to both vendors and get competitive quotes and take a look at them and decide which direction we want to go. Uh, we will be assessing, I'll be assessing some of the section rebalancing options and doing more of the data analysis that I was just talking about and taking a look at possibilities for expanding buffer zones um, or reduced assignment for Thompson. Uh, no, like I said, no changes to take place for 25-26 for next school year, uh, but possible proposals for some uh, minor adjustments in 26-27. So I'm happy to take any questions 
about or attempt to clarify any of that. Mr. Carton, um, the, the projections, the analysis that you said was just completed, will you share that with us before going to LRP with it? Oh, yeah, okay. sure. Ms. Morgan. Um, so I totally agree with, like, when you start doing this, you have to pick a path and mm -hmm. you just have to march down that path because you can't start coming up with a lot of new strategies like in real time. So um, I do think that, and, and we've moved away from this practice, but I do think in the past um, that we have carried um, like sections in the budget that were to be allocated. Um, and, and a lot of the reason for that was that this buffer process is really uncertain and it may be worth considering going back to that practice where that's being held which provides a little bit more um buffer so to speak uh when sort of picking a strategy um because then you know that potentially you could carry two strategies concurrently and have a preferred strategy but then you also know that you're going to be okay with another one so that may be something to think about when we're building the budget um for next year it's it's certainly something that we've done for many, many years and we haven't recently. Um, I think the other piece, just looking at the in and out, my, the in out migration patterns, there shouldn't be anything special necessarily about the buffer zones where kids are moving in and out of those as no. opposed to the town. Which is why I think right? the increase so, made me think maybe Right, There's I mean, the, the, the real estate data the doesn't support it, right? So in, in purchases. so single family condo purchases are not turning over at a faster rate from 22 to 23 but rental markets for sure mm -hmm. potentially right so that would be something to sort of look into and explore and then to work with the you know the registrar's office and the welcome center to you know what can be done the the sooner we get these folks in the door and even just get their name in our system it's just more information so mm -hmm. what what can we do to find these people where they are um my guess is is you know i can we find them before they come to us um, more effectively? And um, that seems like something that potentially we have the capacity to, to consider moving forward. So thank you. This was really um, thorough and helpful. This buffer zone report um, has been enshrined in policy for a very long time um, and has come a long way from uh, presentations of your where, um, yeah, just it's come a long way. So thank you. Dr. Allison Abbey. I was just going to point out that Arlington does have a lot of rentals and they are more likely, to, I mean, a lot of the bigger ones are in the buffer zone areas because of the way the um, lines are drawn. Mm -hmm. because, of the, because the lines are drawn around major geographic things mm -hmm. like Mass, Mass Ave and stuff, and that happens to be where a lot of the rentals are. So there can be some increased movement in and out of buffer zones above movement in and out of the rest of the um, area. But um, just pointing that out. I'm kind of geeky and I got back on the committee in 2012 when we were creating the buffer zones um, and it, w it was a real challenge. Um, and a couple of the challenges we faced were like major streets like Park Avenue, Mass Ave, uh, difficult to place a buffer zone across one of those streets and I'm sure that the superintendent has found out that people who are north of Mass Ave who were in Hardy District are now Hardy Thompson buffer don't want to cross Mass Ave. They, for even for just for geographic reasons, want to head over to the Thompson. And crossing Spy Pond is sort of difficult, so that it's hard to expand Hardy West. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with you in picking a path because having scheduled high schools, there are 
you, you, it's a building block thing. And once you have a first assumption in there, that sort of drives the rest of the assumptions. Mm -hmm. And if you yank that first assumption out from underneath the, uh, the Jenga puzzle, uh, everything comes falling apart. And usually the thing that defines a, a school schedule more than anything else besides the cafeteria. Um, I do not believe we're going to have a decline in enrol enrollment. No, no data that I have seen tells me we're going to decline. Um, and I really support uh, a very thoughtful uh, approach to taking a look at the uh, demographics in the town. Um, we've adopted the MBTA Communities Act. The goal of that is to increase density and development in residential housing. Uh, increases in residential housing means increases in children, and residential housing means increases in students attending the schools. Uh, this is a tremendously thoughtful report, and we are blessed to have such detailed analysis, and I, I'm very blessed to have such great colleagues who are thoughtful about this and can handle that. Uh, uh, Leba Hyam was the chair of the uh, community relations subcommittee when we first did the uh, buffer zones, and I know we all, I, I give her a lot of credit for where we came at at that point, and uh, I know I spent more time consuming coffee with people in, in the town over the redistricting and buffer zones when we instituted them than on any other issue that I've seen in my years of service. So stay tuned, everyone. This is, this is always a challenge. Superintendent's update, you're back on. I'm back. Yeah. All right. I talked a little bit. So folks want to yeah. have a wonderful night. Yeah. Now that you're sticking around for the buffer zone report. Um, OK. I have a quick update tonight. Our Black Student Union honored one of their teachers recently um, at the high school with, his, uh, with an award that they generated themselves and were very proud to present to one of their teachers for his impact and influence on curriculum and youth at Arlington High School. They honored um, Mr. Toro, who has been a teacher in the History and Social Studies Department for a long time. Um, if you recall, last year he worked with a couple of his colleagues to launch the African American Studies class, and the students were really excited to present their inaugural um, award to Mr. Toro for the impact that he has had on students of color at Arlington High School. And then they got surprised by being honored by Dr. Janger for their leadership and impact on belonging and inclusion at Arlington High School as the leaders of the Black Student Union. Um, it is a it is a very full group of excited students who are looking to make change and improve inclusion across the entire student body. Um, it is a really exciting group of young people who have joined all sorts of district-wide and school-wide initiatives to improve their community. And so I think these were well-deserved awards for the four students you see um, pictured there. Letty uh, is an uh, intern now in central office um, and has been interning with Mr. Coleman in the data office and is working on the inclusive spaces uh, working group uh, with us and was on one of the other working groups last year. She was on the MTSS working group and so um, we know some of these students from seeing them in our own hallways and we're really proud of the leadership that they have demonstrated and it was exciting to see them honored by the principal last week uh, for the work that they have done for the entire community. We have also had last, I believe this was last week, uh, panels, uh, voter registrations and student-led debates at Arlington High School for our first um, Arlington High School Voter Registration and Civics Day. Uh, students attended panels to hear from leaders in Arlington um, and other folks uh, dedicated to the work to improve uh, students' access to civic engagement. And um, it was a very exciting day and students really enjoyed it, got a lot of exciting feedback or positive feedback from our student body. The Multilingual Learner Parent Advisory Committee or MLPAC held its first meeting of the 2024-25 school year about a week and a day ago. It was very well attended. Uh, it happened at the Robbins Library in the community room and it's really good to see this group uh, gaining some momentum and having some strong participation after we worked for a little while to get it off the ground. We have started EL education school visits. Those are off to a spectacular start at Down and Brackett. Dr. Ford Walker, I'm gonna put you entirely on the spot. Is there anything you'd like to say about this work? 
Yeah, no, we've been um, we've been off to a great start this week. Um, we were able to visit 12 classrooms. Um, we are looking at instruction and providing um, not necessarily a score, but we're looking at seven indicators and then looking to see um, where uh, those classrooms fall on that particular indicator. Um, and it's just been a great start, and principals have um, can have added to this being su super helpful um, for them in terms of understanding what next steps are that they should prioritize as it relates to providing support to their staff around the EL rollout. So it's been super helpful thus far. And our partner, um, EL Education, uh, we were able to actually meet in person for these walkthroughs, and so there were two team members from the Washington, D.C. area who flew in and walked us through um, this whole process and also uh, provided planning support to our principals the following day as well. So it's been off to a great start. And all schools will participate this year. And they're off to Stratton tomorrow, right? Uh, there's, visit, there's a visit. Okay. Yes. There's not that. There are all sorts of visits all yes. over the place <laughs> happening, and we're really excited that they're here supporting our leaders and our teachers. Um, and looking at the instruction and, and helping this rollout get off to a great start. Uh, we have a METCO showcase this coming Saturday at the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club. This is from 12 to 2, and it's an opportunity for us to share with families who are considering the METCO program a little bit about Arlington. I will be attending, as well as a number of leaders from APS, uh, in hopes that we can encourage families to consider putting Arlington down as one of their choices as they potentially enroll and consider the METCO program for their students. Um, I have a quick hiring update. We are excited to welcome and we'll be sending an announcement, um, I believe first thing tomorrow, uh, welcoming our new Director of Finance, Tam Tran. Tam is joining us from Brookline Public Schools. Um, and brings a lot of knowledge about finance. He was the deputy CFO in Lowell of finance there for a period of time um, and has been doing a lot of data and accountability work uh, since then in Brookline and uh, will bring a lot of knowledge about systems and how to use data on the finance side of things to streamline some of our systems. And we're looking forward to having this really critical role filled finally after it's been vacant for a little while. I also want to welcome Drew Barker and Victor Lee. These are Harvard EDLD superintendent fellows this year. They will be hanging around central office and doing a lot of really exciting work. As a matter of fact, um, Mr. Barker helped me out with some of that retroactive analysis that I was just showing you a few minutes ago and has a pretty keen understanding of buffer zones at this <laughs> point. <laughs> um, and it was really helpful to have some of that additional capacity. Mr. Lee will be focusing on some work in HR to uh, sort of streamline some of our data collection there and make sure that we are building some of the systems to keep track of things that we need to make sure we're keeping track of according to some of our um, agreements and contracts. So. We're looking forward to welcoming them. Um, this is a great program that allows people to learn about district-wide leadership and build some of our capacity in the superintendent's office um, as well. So I also, hmm? oh yes, and uh, Mr. Barker is also an Arlington parent uh, who just moved to the area. And so he has that in perspective and of, of that. His sixth grader came home from um, going to nature's classroom not too long ago, and that was when I met him. So I got to hear all about what that experience was like, too. Uh, your enrollments are in the materials for tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Seeing none, uh, consent agenda. All items listed are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 25094 in the amount of $1,117,491.35 dated uh, October 22nd and the regular school committee minutes uh, for the meeting of October 12th. Motion by Dr. Allison Ampey, second by Mr. Thielman. Uh, roll call, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative, seven nothing, that is unanimous. We go on to subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Budget Allison Budget will Ampey. be meeting on November 13th. 
November 13th. 13th. I think. Okay, community relations, Ms. Exton. Nothing to report. Okay, CIAA, Curriculum Instruction Assessment and Accountability, Ms. Morgan. The CIAA subcommittee will be meeting on November 4th at 3.30, and we are gonna talk about priority one, history graduation requirements, secondary class enrollments. Okay, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we will schedule a meeting in November. In November. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We are meeting on November 12th, Tuesday the 12th, not the 5th because of the election. And we're actually meeting in person and talking about um, end game, uh, different, different possible uh, projects or work that we can do towards the end of the project. Uh, the superintendent and her staff have come up with some uh, proposals that the committee's gonna weigh. Okay, <clears throat> liaison reports, any announcements, future agenda items? Uh, Mr. Spiegel, uh, do we have an executive session tonight? I don't know that we do. Mm -hmm. no. We do not. Uh, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn by nobody, Mr. Thielman wants to adjourn. I do. Uh, seconded by Dr. Halson Ampey on the motion to adjourn. Roll call vote. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative. We, it is now 9, 12 p.m. and we are adjourned. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.